Uh, great. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, uh, first, maybe um, I introduce the critics. The critics already have a, a sense of what you have been up to because I sent them uh, the, a brief description and, um, and, uh, and some videos. I don't know if you had a chance to look at them. Uh, all of you, but uh, I will go through the, um, the most important issues uh, uh, briefly. And I think we have a lot of time today because uh, the students uh, have been working in groups during these last uh, two weeks and a half in groups of three. So this is a very short project uh, that originally was going to take a little longer, but because of the, all the, the difficulties of transitioning to online and losing time with the additional spring break, we had like additional week. Uh, so the project got uh, really shortened. Um, but uh, yeah, so that's what you will be uh, looking at today. Um, we're uh, first going to introduce the critics. I'm, I'm very happy uh, to that we have uh, here um, today um, a very good, uh, I think, a very suited uh, group of critics. Um, so first, uh, we have uh, Felicia Dean, who have uh, Felicia Francine Dean, which uh, who, who I have met uh, several times in uh, at conferences in the Interior Design Educator Council uh, a, a conference annual conference, and um, she teaches at the University of Tennessee. Uh, and her research um, addresses analog and digital craft, uh, which is. Uh, uh, I think quite suited also no, for the, that early phase of the semester and even this last phase in the sense that some of you have been starting to think about how you would be making these things. Uh, so I think she could be a great asset no, in, in, in providing feedback there. Uh, then we have also uh, Ryan uh, Ludwig. Ryan uh, is an assistant professor at the School of Architecture and Interior Design at the University of Cincinnati. Um, and uh, we uh, we used to, we taught together for two two years, Ryan. Uh, uh, actually, it was just one. I was only in Buffalo for one year. Just one. Yeah, yes, I couldn't remember. I don't know. It was a while ago now. <laughs> but it was our first time teaching ever. Yeah, that's course. right. So yeah. it was very bonding. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and um, yeah, and uh, and he he's also very interested in, in the topics that we are touching on this studio. He, he's writing this book right now that is going to be launched by Rutledge in, a 20, in 2020, in the fall, uh, Beyond Sustainable Architecture Evolving Environments of Habitation, uh, where the intent of the book is to reconceptualize architecture as the implicit uh, collaborative product of environmental inhabitant reciprocity, which I think is uh, touches on some of the ways that you have uh, been considering uh, the built environment uh, this semester. No? Um, uh, and then we have Tammy uh, Glass, which uh, who you all know. Uh, I, I don't know if you have actually uh, been in Tammy's class. I, I guess yes. And some, yeah. So she's faculty here, associate professor. And she, uh, and I think, uh, I mean, she also, uh, uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with her last book, uh, well, the, the book that uh, she recently completed and that they got um, also awards, uh, was awarded uh, this uh, last annual conference in the Interior Design Educator Council. But, and, um, and she, uh, I think also the subject of her book is very suited for this uh, particular exercise. Uh, where you guys are working on an intervention in a window and she's been looking at how a single product or a piece of furniture can promote social interactions, encourage changes in behavior and challenge uh, accepted cultural norms. So in a way that's uh, very much what you guys are doing when you are bringing up these issues uh, about uh, pollinators no? with your intervention uh, in, a, in a window no? and uh, hoping to change uh, people's uh, thinking about the environment. So um, uh, yeah, I think it's a great uh, group um, of critics. We will be seeing uh, just uh, two uh, groups on this first half uh, of students. The students, uh, so this is their last semester um, for most of them, but one, like I was saying before, uh, this is an advanced studio 
um, in, and it's a combination of interior design students and architecture students. Uh, most of, uh, and also a combination of undergrads and grads. On this first half, we're going to be looking at uh, uh, the first uh, group is uh, undergrad and the second group is uh, graduate students. And then in the second half is also a combination. Um, the, so uh, I guess, I guess uh, Felicia and Tammy, did you get a chance to look at the videos that I sent you? Yeah, yeah I looked at the, um, the videos and uh, some of the work that's already up too. Oh, great, great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So then, uh, even though the, the topic is a little out there, no, I think you you are uh, already familiar. Uh, yeah, I feel I feel very well versed <laughs> by what your students put up. Yeah. Okay. So so yeah, after thinking that most of the semester around these different topics, first uh, how to raise awareness about the endangerment of local pollinators, and then with the objective also as designers to kind of um discover a uh, new aesthetics uh, optical effects uh, and uh, visual pleasures in uh, in 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 looking at a uh, multi species understanding of the built environment um so uh, this uh, exercise uh, that finishes the semester and is very short it was only yeah two weeks and a half um uh, tries to intervene in uh, one of the classrooms in the architecture school uh Permanently, so that that was the, the the original idea, and the reason to do this is because there was actually an initiative in the school to renovate one of the classrooms uh, in uh, in one of our major buildings, uh, the, the the one that hosts the most studio buildings. We have several buildings on campus. This uh, Goldsmith is one of them, and uh, they were going to renovate one classroom, and they wanted. Uh, to provide an opportunity for students to design a piece within the space. Uh, we had another initiative similar two years ago and uh, a, a studio developed a design and build project uh, where they did an intervention in one of the walls. Um, and this was very successful. Uh, so they wanted to repeat that, uh, that, uh, that model where uh, there was gonna be a, an overall refurbishment of the classroom. The students are working off the plans and drawings of the interior design practice that was gonna renovate uh, the space. Um, and, uh, but they are not intervening. I mean, I, I, they're intervening, it's, it's up to them basically where they intervene. It had to uh, in, uh, incorporate a window and all of these ideas about vision and uh, embracing awareness about uh, local pollinators, but it was left to them how to do it in that uh, because uh, after COVID-19, the whole project uh, was uh, kind of um, its on hold. Uh, I didn't uh, want to, and given the, the short time that we could dedicate to it in the end, um, we uh, I left it a little bit to their interpretation uh, in terms of the scope. Uh, so where they know it should be realistic, uh, but uh, maybe sometimes they're a bit more ambitious than they would have been if we really had to build this this summer, which is not going to be the case. No, uh, so um, in that they took maybe they intervened in more windows than they would have normally, etc. But I think all the projects could be scaled down to something that is feasible and that could be built, and that they, you guys, when you look at them, you should. Um, you should uh, criticize them also with that uh, with that idea, no? That they, they should be feasible, um, and um, yeah. And um, I don't know. If, do you guys have any questions about uh, the project? Um, hopefully, also as they show you the work, um, you I think uh, it will be more. Uh, all of these things will be more self-evident, and they will be. They will show you. The students will show you the site where where they're intervening, etc. Um, also, uh, they were encouraged to uh, use as much as they could from the preliminary research that they did, uh, and also their material explorations earlier in the semester. But because they were working in groups of three, they had to negotiate, uh, in, and they have done it in different ways. In meaning, in sometimes they have really started a new design proposal. In some cases, they're recycling aspect from their previous designs. Uh, and in some cases, from all of the members of the team, and in some cases, from uh, they have chosen 
one of the projects from the members of the team. So you will see different approaches. Uh, some of the projects are um, mostly, uh, it, they're like purely interior design application where uh, there's, a, and then some of the projects are uh, also uh, incorporating a habitat, um, uh, some sort of form of um, a habitat uh, for insect species. No, so um, you will see. Uh, I think in the in this first half we're going to see an example of both. Um, so yeah, with that uh, maybe um, I think we can uh, get started with the first team. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen. We can do that. Okay, can everyone see that? Yeah. Perfect. Um, so my name's Elizabeth and Taylor and Nyla um, are my, I'm Taylor. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm just going to go ahead and start. So prison space is an interior window intervention in Goldsmith Hall. Um, if you want to move on to the next slide, Elizabeth. Um, so it's located in Goldsmith Hall, which is one of the three architecture buildings on UT's campus. Um, this intervention occurs on a third floor studio overlooking a courtyard and has north and east facing windows. So. Connecting our design to insect vision, we are really interested in polarization and color vision. Um, so polarization is when light waves are um, put through almost a filter and kind of creates an isolated effect, which in the second photograph you can see, it's actually a cup with a polarized filter over it and it kind of creates this beautiful color effect that we can see. So, Humans can't naturally see polarization, but bees can, and they often use this to navigate through their surroundings and to detect desirable flowers for pollinization, pollination. Um, along with that, color vision, insects see vastly different than humans do. Um, butterflies see all the way from ultraviolet to um, red, while bees only see purple to green and a few yellows. Um, so while we are considering polarization and color vision, we were inspired by Rainbow Church by Hojin Yoshika. Um, it was an exhibit in 2008 in Seoul, Korea, that was an 800 meter high wall of crystal prisms that when light went through it, it refracted and created a space full of beautiful rainbows. Um, and we are also drawn to macro photography of butterfly wings and how kind of the beautiful details that come through the patterns of the wings. Uh, how we were considering these precedents, we developed multiple window iterations um, of this intervention, kind of exploring how these crystals within the window um, could create different uh, casts of light in the space. So we ended up on two different iterations that kind of have um, a different purpose and dominate, dominance within the studio in Goldsmith. So Goldsmith is a historical building and we did want to honor the existing windows while creating an artistic intervention of our um, bug vision research. I want to go to the next slide, Elizabeth. The top half of the window uh, mimics the existing uh, mullion grid on the bottom half. Um, so the prisms end up being one foot in height and about two inches in depth. Um, and so this decision to keep this intervention on the top half was in order to preserve the sight lines in the courtyard. So no matter where you are in the room, um, whether you're sitting, standing, you can still see into the beautiful courtyard below. Um, so this window, yeah, as you can see in these sections, uh, this window will be constructed by sandwiching uh, the crystal and intervention between two planes of glass and then between each row there will glass that these um, crystals will be ultimately fastened to. So another important aspect of these crystal prisms is the addition of an etching of a specific Austin local pollinators uh, that we did research on you'll see a little bit later and this will just create an extra lighting effect um, kind of bringing attention to the importance of the local pollinators. 
this is just a, a in close drawing so you can see what an etching would look like on the crystal prism and um, it would create the shadow effect in this space and so these are the different insects that, that the studio studied at the beginning of the semester and we did all sorts of different research on um, their appearance and nesting you know habitat what food the plants they like and so each individual person in the studio had one insect and um, studied it and so ultimately we ended up with all of this research of insects that are local to Austin and so in using um, in incorporating you know insect vision in this studio we wanted another um, an additional way to bring attention to insects because although um, all of the rainbows and the crystal prisms and light refraction do like uh, abstract and recreate this idea of polarized light. Somebody who has no clue what insect vision is about isn't instantly going to know that. And so this is just another aspect of this intervention that enhances the idea of, you know, this is about insects and it casts these shadows. Um, so this is the floor plan. This is where the Goldsmith Courtyard is located. And so it's on um, the south side of the courtyard. And I'll go to the next, this is a more zoomed in plan. So the windows are located, or the windows that face the exterior are located on the north facade and on the east facade. And so that is primarily where um, this, the light refraction will come in and you'll be able to see the rainbows cast throughout the space and um, depending on the time of day. But these little nooks right here, we um, put in place to create a sort of break space in studio because studio is a place where, you know, School of Architecture students, you're there all day, you're working and um, there's not really a place to go and really take a break from school. And so we wanted to create this intervention that um, looks into the courtyard and looks out through these windows that creates this kind of rest space. And so we used the macro photography of the butterfly wings to kind of create a sort of hierarchy in this space that lets you know it really is a place to take a break. And so this is the fabric is an abstraction of the, the micro photography of the butterfly wings. And um, as you can see, Taylor earlier mentioned that we decided on two final window iterations, one that only had one row of these crystal prisms and then another that had the entire top half full of the crystal prisms. And that additionally is just to enhance the hierarchy in this space and this idea of a break from work. So when you're sitting at, you know, your your desk or the work tables, you're not being constantly, you know, blinded by these rainbow lights, but it just is this really beautiful and subtle, delicate intervention that casts these rainbows on your workspace. But then when you decide to take a break and go sit in these nooks, um, it's just this enhanced sense of rainbow where it's only in this one space. And so um, that, sorry, uh, Elizabeth, uh, maybe in the plan, can you show again the working surface since it's the first time that they see like what yes. is the plan from the interior designers for the space? Yes, so this is the um, existing proposed plan for the space. And so um, the, pr the proposal is that, you know, you have your desks here, but also in studio, you're constantly making models and cutting things and using your exacto. So there are these wood tables located along the perimeter of the walls that provide a working space where you can sit or stand and cut your materials and whatnot. And so that is what these spaces are for. And so that's why, you know, we decided to be more subtle with the interventions right along the working tables so that it wouldn't be um, so as intense in the working spaces. But then when you decide to sit and, you know, take a break from your work, it, you kind of are immersed in the rainbow and it creates this beautiful experience in this nook space. And so Nyla is gonna talk about um, the different lighting effects here. Yes. 
So um, this is a plan showing the prism light refraction. So earlier in the window diagram, you saw that the prism we're using is a triangular prism. And uh, generally through research, I found um, it, the angle of refraction is almost consistently 20 degrees less than the angle of the incidence. Um, so that's just what this diagram is showing here. And yeah, with the different times of year, the light would, yeah. Yeah, I'm going to go into that a little bit. Oh, well, okay. <laughs> so, so this is the same information, but now in renderings. So based on um, information about the intensity of direct light in um, Goldsmith, the time frame for refraction on the east facade would be from about 8 in the morning until 9 in the morning. And the time frame for the refraction on the north facade is from about 5.30 in the evening until 6.30 in the evening. Depending on the time of year, it can vary about 30 minutes, give or take. Um, and for the north facade, actually, the light um, in the cooler months from October to April, the light isn't intense enough um, for the refraction to actually occur. So we wouldn't have that experience from October to April on that side. And uh, sorry, um, in both cases, the light would be strongest from June to August, about um, around that summer equinox time. So the goal that we had when coming up with this idea was really creating a ritualistic experience that was almost like a celebration um, of time and of nature. So um, we were able to bring nature into the studio space by just allowing the rhythm of the day and the seasons to create this um, experience. Um, and in architecture especially, there's a very strong culture of workaholics and we all know that sometimes it's not necessarily healthy. And this project allows like for something as little as the passage of time to become present in the workspace. Um, and it's, you can go to the next slide. <laughs> you can kind of cycle through these, but um, this intervention is really meant to be a forced break time for the hour, hour and a half or so where people can take the time to contemplate like their aspirations from the day, if it's the, for the day, if it's the morning, or if it's the evening, how their day went, or they can, you know, take a break and enjoy the experience alongside meal or a meal or coffee. Um, so it's really kind of forcing that break time and becoming a ritualistic experience within the workspace. Yeah. And this is just an up close, you can see how the etchings would um, cast shadows within the space. So it's pretty subtle and it just creates this beautiful, um, you know, enhancement of this idea of insect vision. So that's it. I just had a question if it's okay to jump in, um, which was really just to understand a little bit more the, the, the kind of macro graphic of the butterfly wing what is that exactly? You, you mentioned fabric, I think, at one point. Yeah. So it's obviously like a, a kind of alcove nook, but, mm -hmm. but, and it's on all of the sides, not just the... Yes, correct. And what is it? It's, it's just a graphic or is it fabric? Or can you maybe talk a little bit more about kind of literally, physically what it is? So it, yeah, it would be um, a print on a fabric. So it, it would be a sort of covering that um, is, is a graphic of this macro image, macro photography. Um, but yes, it would, be, it would be a fabric that covers all the sides. And then at the bottom, you can see a little, there's a, a little four inch cushion that covers the bottom that um, just provides a sense of, you know, enhanced, it, allows you to be comfortable in the space. Is the last slide in there, Elizabeth? The, that one? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. And just one other question so I understand. Everything that you're proposing is your proposal, right? So the, the, the layout of the tables, the works, the, the perimeter model making surface, all that stuff you explained, that's something you're proposing or is that? No. So the tables and the work tables around the windows are what the interior designers are renovating are proposing for this space. So our intervention would be the nook and the windows. I see. Okay. Yeah. So just to clarify, that's that will be throughout. I think everybody adopted the 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 new layout in that um, 
the way the the space is right now, it has a uh, it, it has these old furnishings like drawing tables, uh, and there is um, the school. I, is is uh, launching this classroom design almost as a test to uh, where they were betting more for people working on their computers in those central uh, tables. Uh, what the idea is usually in these classrooms, there's up to two studios, not not just uh, one, mm. uh, with a shifting in numbers population depending on the semester. So uh, that's why the designers, uh, these are some local uh, interior design, this is a local interior design uh, firm, they uh, propose these um, shared uh, office-like tables for people working the computer in the center, in the central axis of the space, and then on the perimeter, these uh, long uh, tables by the window for working on computer, uh, sorry, for working on models. So, um, yeah, uh, and, and the license in terms of colors and thing, uh, that's something because they haven't really designed those central elements, uh, often the, it's kind of they're toned down or abstracted to a certain degree because it was not the center of the of their the students design they're mostly intervening in um in the in the windows or or however they want but um yeah got it yeah i mean i i guess maybe i'll just throw out a couple comments then and say that i i really like i like the general scope of the proposal in a way i think it is kind of reasonable i guess in a sense of the parameters that you've been given relative to you know, the things that um, Nerea, you just outlined as far as what, what's happening and how you as a group might might intervene and provide like um, a, a kind of interject into the space without necessarily like redesigning the whole thing. So the alcove is an interesting concept, I think that allows, you know, some impact. It's, it is creating a kind of micro space and then the glazing effect, obviously, in the, all the ways that you talked about can sort of penetrate into the space as well. I guess I would maybe challenge a little bit because I really like the, well, I like both components quite a bit and just from a visual aesthetic point of view, but also in, yeah, like that's a good one to stop on. Um, and their, their kind of impact on the space. And I, I guess I do wonder if you were to challenge, let's say some of the layout a little bit more, you know, even in subtle ways, like the, the graphic on the, of the butterfly, like, I don't know, does it somehow, you know, get overlaid to part of the floor or something, or even just a pattern in which, you know, it, it sort of presents itself more or engages more with the space outside of just the alcove to kind of invite you in. I mean, I know the lighting effect sort of is intended to do that as well, but I maybe would also wonder if there isn't opportunity for it to like, I don't know, like I almost want it to like get bigger or smaller, like have some kind of flexibility to it. And I understand it's kind of a dedicated built in alcove. So in that sense, I understand the limitation, but I guess I'm wondering like, what if I, what if I really want to get away for a second, you know, like I just, I need like 10 minutes or I have like a call that I really need to take. And I, you know, I just, uh, I need a little privacy and I'm, I guess I'm just wondering, like, is there, is there a way to like create even a kind of space within that space, either through nothing too uh, uh, kind of intense, maybe like some kind of curtain or maybe some other secondary surface that maybe pulls down or pulls around that I could really like be in that space because there is a, you, you still are very much kind of within the studio environment and because it is so open and, you know, when that thing's full, there's going to be a lot of people, you know, working or maybe listening to music or talking or whatnot. So the alcove seems like a, um, like a good solution on one level, but I do wonder if there's like another subtle layer that if overlaid into it could, could kind of give it um, a little bit of, a little bit of um, flexibility in that point, uh, in that sense, sorry. And then one other kind of just direct question, I, I'm really interested in the fabric part of it too. And I wonder if you really like had the time to kind of advance the fabric part, how in the same way that you treated this um, prism 
and the attention to that, if the fabric also somehow was designed in a way with even just like particular kinds of thread that were reflective or had iridescent properties or I don't know, like just the quality of that, I think would be really interesting to explore as well and because the graphic and the color and the pattern is so nice and so strong. And I wonder if like you really, if you took it into the next scale of actually trying to make it, right? what would that we, be? We mentioned that, but we weren't sure if it existed or not. <laughs> yeah, when we were discussing what we wanted to put on the inside, if we, you know, ideally, you know, we were talking about, you know, we would want to introduce some sort of iridescence or, or something that's kind of shimmery within the space in the fabric just to enhance that. Um, so, I, I mean, I completely agree. I think that's a great comment. And I, I think that would be really beautiful. Yeah, I, I mean, I I, um, I know there's definitely gonna be things that you can introduce into the fabric. I actually have a, um, an upholstery diploma in between my undergrad and graduate degree um, and focus on, um, when I focus on making analog and digital, I focus on textiles and fibers quite a bit. Um, so, th I mean, there's definitely going to be elements. I mean, even in the 50s, um, there were, you know, there was furniture that had uh, silver thread threading through it, um, you know, metallics threaded through it. So historically, you will see that and be able to use that as a context and even see kind of where it is today. And today you may even see things where um, they're heat sensitive, right? So color may change. Um, even the, the surface design might change itself too, um, which could be really interesting thinking about the time of day and um, kind of how that looks. One thing I'm wondering is like, who gets that space, right? Because it's like emphasized, like who gets to sit there? Because there's only, is there only one location? Is that right of this? There's, there's two. two. There's two. Um, so who, so who, who gets these maybe where two people can sit in each? out of all of this? Is it like first come first? I mean, what, what's your intention? Because it does seem very emphasized and you do have that hierarchy there. And it seems like it's either kind of all of this like experience with the light and the textile. And then you kind of get, you know, the other more subtle experiences of light coming in, um, you know, of different variations. So I'm just, I'm just curious, you know, to have you think about like, as, you, as you're designing this, like, um, are you excluding people from that area um, or is it your intention to you know help it to create more variety within that space by doing that um, are there other areas um, such as um, that was mentioned before with ryan that there's almost like an in-between right more variation of these types of spaces um, in order for choices to happen um, whether it's by you know individual wanting to be in a space the whole time or move throughout and I think, you know, I think it's definitely a hard project. Um, I mean, you have a functional space that you're putting this like very experiential, like, um, you know, moment in for people, right? Um, with light and color, it's uh, very ethereal. Um, it's very, what some people would call heavenly, right? Um, like these images that you have. So I, I do think um, one of the biz big, biggest uh, things is, trying to navigate between like that function of what people will be doing and how that experience either promotes or could potentially inhibit that function of that space too. So are there any instances that you all thought about like because laptops you know have a reflective quality to the screen are there any instances within the space that um, you thought about kind of where there could be moments um, to where things aren't, maybe there's very little. I know you have the pains that change, but that still seems like kind of a lot coming in with the uh, depth of that per, um, that projection into that space. Well, I think uh, we are kind of just really focusing on it being during those periods of time you don't work because it's only for like an hour-ish each day. And it also conveniently yeah the hours tend to be around when classes begin and around where our current classes end. So it's not extremely impeding, like it's not during class times, especially studio times, they happen between one and five, typically. Okay, so it's an hour, it's, it's an hour a day. Um, yeah. I, I would still kind of look into the, you know, the laptops and light coming in. Um, and I'd also think about, you know, the sensory experience of, you know, a diverse population of students um, a while back, I did a video show. You see all these TVs um, with my collaborator, and uh, we had a lot of moving imagery that he works on. 
and some people really enjoyed it, um, but some people it was really overwhelming for them. Um, and they, they, they could get it, but at the same time, they didn't have that same level of fulfillment out of the space um, because there wasn't enough like uh, maybe pauses or move in between certain things. The space was so activated. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I do wonder if there's ways in which you could even maybe not project down, but project up, right, onto the ceiling even. So it's not that the projection is always down and on a surface and on someone, but the pro being project mainly maybe up or in other directions of this. So in one of the cases, like it all has to do with where the incident light angle is, but in one of the cases mm -hmm. around the winter equinox on the east facade, it does project onto the ceiling instead. At a certain time of day though, right? Yes, and like during a certain season, it's just from the morning, but it's not. Yeah, but I'm yeah, wondering if you could have movers. Like, kind of... mm. Yeah. Oh, that would be really interesting. Yeah. Yeah, because you could control somewhat of it and, and you know create louvers that direct the light um, in certain areas, just like you would uh, having an actual fixture in a space, right? Yeah. Um, to where you you do have a little bit more control over that, or where that's placed, or maybe where even that etching is placed. Um, I'd also say I'd push the etching a bit more. It seems a little too literal right now um, with like kind of having that idea and just kind of placing it as a decorative item. I would push it more. Maybe something happens to where over the time of day, you're able to create something. And this, I mean, I think it's feasible, but it would take a lot of research um, that all of a sudden the way the direction of the light comes in, it then creates the actual etching. But when it's hitting a different way, the etching is split apart and it's completely different. Right. Mm -hmm. So you only yeah. get to see that moment at a certain time of day. Mm -hmm. But again, yeah. I think you got you all had a really difficult job with, you know, what's happening in that space and the variety of students coming in the space um, with this uh, really beautiful experience that you're you're showcasing. Um, and I think you, you definitely have a lot of great decisions made with um, the quantity of projection um, based upon certain times of day and that you've really done well with that for sure. I was just gonna add one other thing that popped into my head um, from Felicia's comments because I didn't quite catch it in your presentation, but I, I guess it makes sense now, which is that the, the effect is only every so often, right? And so it's not a kind of constant thing. So when it does happen, it, it actually has the potential to really affect um, not just an effect, but but produce a kind of social effect within the space. So, okay, we're starting to see this like iridescent projection. Oh, okay, that means like we're going to take like a half hour break or we're going to, it, it, it maybe even it's even that, you know, you really can't work in there when, when this is happening. It really intentionally like blocks your screen because, you know, as you were saying earlier in the presentation, you know, architects but so many people in general just have a tendency to like keep working 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 and not take breaks and so actually the projection in a way forces you <laughs> to kind of like not work on your computer and get up and like you know take a break or chat with your neighbor and so this idea that the effect can actually have really specific like social and even cultural reper repercussions within the context of that studio space i find to be like really interesting yeah that was yeah, that was one of our, you know, ideas in doing this is it's kind of, I mean, there are so many times I've been in studio and I'm like, oh my gosh, it's eight o'clock. Like I didn't even realize it, you know? And so this is kind of like telling time without a clock where you're like, oh my God, like, oh, it must be dinner time. That time, you know, like I need to take a break. Um, so yeah, it kind of forces you to, to, you see it and you're like, okay, like I've been here for 12, like eight hours, I need to take a break. I need to go get some food. And, and that's also like a really historically like almost, uh, you know, for thousands of years, right? We've, we've marked things through these kind of solar alignments and, and gave them kind of, um, uh, not authority, but marked them in an, or appreciative of them. And they, they were very, really important in these other ways. They had another whole kind of meaning in terms of, and now that's maybe like taking it to an extreme, but I just, raised to say that this kind of idea is not actually really new at all. The idea that these kind of alignments mm -hmm. and effects actually ha could have great meaning, you know, obviously has a long mm -hmm. history. So again, I think even though it's a really kind of microcosm, 
and specific to architecture or like interior design environments that you're talking about, I think it's actually pretty, has like some pretty su strong significance or possible significance in it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I appreciate Ryan's comments about um, creating a, a sort of social, a social impact in the space. I'm, I'm not quite sure I'm, I'm so keen on the like f enforced <laughs> that, it, that it has to be, um, I do like the idea that it could have some, some operability or sense of choice to it, um, like Felicia was mentioning. I do wonder, uh, did you consider that the windows are operable windows and how that might interact with your, with your particular intervention? Would, it, would the windows still be operable? Yes, they would. That was one thing that we focused on was maintaining the operability of the windows. Okay. So, you know, having, having the, the ability to control your environment gives a lot of autonomy to, to you all as students because so many places we go into, you can't open the window. Um, and, and to have the possibility of potentially having some, some way or some say to kind of participate in when and if you have these effects, I think could, be, could also be potentially really interesting. I wonder if you considered any in a different type of intervention on the north side since it didn't quite respond in the same way that the east side did. Because you're treating it exactly the same, even though you know that the um, that the the effect is 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 pretty different. Yeah, I don't think we really had the time for that. It's we actually started with the north facade intervention and added the east facade later and it wasn't until mm -hmm. further on in the research process that we discovered that it wouldn't um, be occurring on that facade during the winter equinox month so I think if we had more time that would that's something that we'd address yeah that seems like an opportunity not only to bring us to to bring attention to time of day and and daylight conditions, but also orientation. So it could be a way to get us to kind of notice that we're we're facing a different direction, and especially given the you know what we do in creating buildings, that orientation is so critical. Um, I also really wonder about uh, finishes and how how the the new kind of lighting condition how it reacts with the finishes. So we're kind of looking at this sort of whited out uh, interior, which I know the idea is to sort of mute, to sort of mute what's not designed yet. But at the same time, we have the character of the windows, which are, which are wooden windows. We have, you know, other aspects of the space that would, that would be maintained. And, you know, I sort of wonder how these effects would intermingle with all of those sort of real finishes. I mean, they look really beautiful in sort of a, a pure white space, but what might they look like in a space that's, you know, busier with lots of other things? You know, this isn't a museum, a museum type of atmosphere. And, you know, the one finish that you do give us that's very particular, which is the fabric, that's the one that I really kind of wonder, because it is primarily black, um, how, you know, how that sort of actually absorbs the effect that you're creating. I don't know, I really just sort of, I wonder about the, the actual finishes in the room. And then lastly, I just wanna mention, you know, if you look around to the rest of the building of Goldsmith Hall, I think you could find some clues as to how you could think about using the image or the etching of the, of the insects. So if you look around, there are lots of different stenciled patterns Throughout the, throughout the space. I know you all, many of you being interior students have spent a ridiculous amount of time in the library studio um, that has these sort of stenciled all along the top. And if you look really closely, they tell stories. And you know, one of them is like, it's a character of the librarian that worked there for from like 1925 to sometime in the 40s. You know, I mean, that's a pretty, that's a pretty fascinating thing. And it's just this other layer of kind of storytelling or narrative that is just, it's, it's put into the environment in a way that we don't notice it all the time. But if we take the time to, to look, we can learn something from it. And so I think this idea of using image can be really powerful. And I wonder if there could be some clues of things that are already in the environment that you could continue this in a sort of contemporary storytelling way to add this to, to Goldsmith Hall. 
Mm -hmm. I'll stop there. <laughs> so much to say. Can I ask if you all had any other titles? I mean, this may seem minor, but like, did you have any other titles for this project? We did. We came up with a lot of different titles for it. Um, like, <laughs> time, we wanted it to, something to do with time, something to do with prism. We like brainstormed probably 10 or 15 different titles um, for it. And the only reason I'm asking, and this might just be me because, you know, maybe it's how I'm accepting quarantine right now. I wasn't looking at your slide when I was first setting up and getting ready for you. I was, you know, using my mouse trying to move windows. Um, and, I, and I had seen your presentation before, but I didn't remember the title of it. Um, it actually sounded like when you presented it, prison space. And I know that may sound a little bit ridiculous, but at the same time, I do think it's important, you know, um, because you do have kind of light filtering in, in these ways that it might filter in through and you have, you know, the mullions on the window and so forth. Um, I don't know, I just either be like, however you're enunciating it or presenting it, especially verbally, I mean, written, it didn't have, there was no issue with it at all. Um, but for some reason, when you said it verbally, I just didn't, it wasn't as clear as I read it say, on your page itself. Gotcha. Okay. It's a great point. It's not something you would normally think about, um, but yes, <laughs> definitely something to consider. Well, uh, I think this was a really great discussion, no? And uh, and uh, open up a lot of. Uh, things for you to think about further, no? I think especially in regards also to, to the fabric, no? To the further development of the fabric, uh, in, in choosing that, in adding that maybe to your portfolios. Uh, it's, it, it was also, it was an interesting test since this is the first review that you guys have uh, for this project as to how the ideas come across. And it was interesting that even though some of the things you were thinking about, but uh, uh, maybe you didn't emphasize them enough when you were talking, uh, so that uh, there, there was a still a big gap for interpretation. No, so um, but uh, I think it's a uh, and and I think in terms of feasibility of the project is definitely something that could happen. I really appreciate the fact that you studied the, the different. Uh, no, the, 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 that you were a bit more rigorous in terms of like time and when this would really happen during the year to make sure that it wouldn't uh, fully uh, no, interrupt uh, uh, the classes. Uh, but uh, of course that uh, other facade didn't receive the same kind of attention. No? The, so a couple, like it's a, this was a bit of a charrette, but there's still a lot of things that could get um, no further development for sure. Uh, so yeah, uh, great job guys. Um, should we move to the next team then? Nadea, can I just mention one thing um, to all of, of your course. students? You a, lot of a couple of years back, <laughs> I went to, um, I went to, I took my students to DC and we saw an exhibit called Wonder at the Renwick Gallery. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's W-O-N-D-E-R. So if your students just want to take a look at that, um, it's installation work also, and a lot deals with like light and color specifically um, within spaces. Great, that's a great reference. And also if you, I mean, I was thinking when you guys brought up the fabric, uh, yeah, that uh, in terms of like the texture, no, because right now it looks like a very flat fabric, but I think part of the fun is like, I think, like thinking about the materiality, the reflectivity of the fabric, but also maybe more as a tape, tape, tape tree. How do you say tape tree? Uh, where parts are like you could get hairy at parts, you know, like if you think of like almost like also the texture of an insect and how it changes, uh, where it doesn't need to, if you have like a very short, a clean trim of the fabric, but you could, I think there would be also opportunities for that pattern to become more uh, furry or hairy or three dimensional, no? Uh, that uh, that would make that uh, that cove a lot more interesting. I mean, it would, where it is promising, but it could be really uh, a very interesting um, space, you know, with with further development of those uh, detailed aspects of the project. 
Yeah, and I don't know also... if you have like ideas about that too. Sorry, Brian. I was just going to throw out another reference that came to mind, which um, is well, certainly more three-dimensional, though slightly different application, but in terms of the fabric or the, I guess it's really the thread that's used. Some of the work of Jenny Sabin and her studio, mm -hmm. um, and most recently, the well, she's done a bunch of sort of installation type things, which are very sculptural, but she's done a lot of research and development of of thread and fabric that has like bioluminescent properties and mm -hmm. it, it really engages with some of the um like the uh, literally the environment and the climate and things and then has these effects like at other times uh, based upon it's like accumulation of energy and then outputting that energy as light so i don't know again keeping in line with some of the conversation about fabric i mean something like that could be really interesting if at night you know this thing yeah. actually started glowing out and you could see, you know, from the courtyard that these things kind of having some effect so that that's not always in, internal, but also could be kind of to the yeah. outside as well. Yeah, yeah. And with the positioning by the window, you could definitely harvest that light, no? Mm -hmm. And I think also even like if, if the fabric could have some type of thermal properties, like, you know, of mm -hmm. warmth, of mm -hmm. a mm -hmm. feeling, not only when you touch it, do you get texture, um, mm -hmm. But what else is like, you know, in that it can happen with uh, the light coming in um, and mm -hmm. the absorption of that light onto that surface. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Um, okay. Thank Super you all exciting. for your critiques. They're really good. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Great job, guys. Uh, so uh, next team. Can you see the screen? Also, um, Marjan, Elena, and Grace, if you can add, put your uh, presentation also in uh, in Zoom, like the previous team did. Ah, oh, no, they didn't do it. No, that was Felicia. Okay, but if you guys, if you have the slide presentation of Google that we talked about, if you can add it in the chat so people can look at it, if you did it, if you didn't do it, then... Uh, yes, we have it. Grace, can you please uh, send the link to the chat? Yeah, then the critics can look at, they can browse through it if they need to uh, after you spoke. Thanks, Felicia, for the link. Yeah. <laughs> So, did I just start? So, hi, I'm Marjan. Hi, my name's Grace. And I'm Elena, and we're all um, grad students finishing the semester in interior design. So, in the second half of the studio, uh, when we had started our design and thinking about the new things that we wanted to design, we had a very, uh, we uh, listened to the great talk by uh, Joyce Wang. And uh, she was talking about uh, how designers, include interior designers and architects, uh, can design buildings in a way that uh, they respond to the uh, uh, things that are living around them, like birds, insects, and animals that are living in our surroundings. Uh, it was a starting point for our team uh, to think about how we can take advantage of this opportunity uh, to, uh, to introduce the insects and birds and uh, animals habitat to our uh, students' life in the classroom. So it was the reason that we uh, called our project in habitat. Next slide, please, Elena. I think there's a delay, so let's go. Ah, okay. okay. Uh, at the beginning of our studio, we have started to design a filters that I may make it possible for humans to see their surrounding as a, a vision of the bees, uh, how they can see the uh, world from their uh, eyes. Uh, there are several great features uh, that uh, are included in their vision, and uh, three of us, including Elena, Grace, and me, uh, we were so interested in the equity aspect of their vision and the uh, uh, colors that they can see. They can see only blue, green, and uh, ultra uh, colors that uh, the previous uh, group mentioned. Uh, so we uh, wanted to think how we can uh, use uh, these aspects in our design and uh, in a different way. Uh, 
uh, that uh, we are going to talk about that in more detail in the future as well. Okay, so while researching for, for the bees and the, the bug filter projects, we were shocked to find out about the rate of the, the insect population decline. So 40% of the, the global insect species have declined over the past decade. And we obviously, we need them to pollinate all the flowers and uh, the rate of its extinction is eight times uh, faster than that of uh, mammals and reptiles and other animals. And also we find out that while we were researching and observing and learning about um, this subject, uh, it, it demystified it. And so our project proposes to demystify the insect to the now the, only the student population. Um, so by, by inserting these habitats on the windows of the studios and that will bring the insect into the classroom, creating a clear connection between both worlds. Um, and having uh, these, these habitats being translucent, uh, the students would be able to observe the animals' um, habits uh, while they are you know, in their transformation. And so they, they, were, they would be open on the outside for the insects to come in, uh, closed on the inside, but it's still a very like bridging the connection between both worlds. So here we can see the oxymetric view of the classroom and uh, the location of the habitat that uh, Elena was mentioning and the fabric that we are using to connect these uh, habitat together. Uh, we have two uh, features in our design uh, that uh, our design uh, fabrics uh, are uh, connecting between each habitat so they can move and uh, they uh, can be open or closed. When they are closed, as you can see uh, in the uh, left image, uh, they can add more uh, uh, aesthetic point of view to the uh, view from the inside to the outside of the classroom. And when the fabric are open and covering the windows, as you can see in the picture in the right, they uh, add more uh, performatic uh, quality to the uh, window because we, uh, we have the working surface underneath of the windows. So if the students want to have more light, they can adjust the uh, position of the fabric, they can close or open it. So they can have more uh, light or less light based on the activity or work that they want to do in the classroom. Uh, here you can see the, uh, the initial idea for the locating of the uh, habitat in the windows was based on the insects and based on the uh, uh, pattern of the bees and butterfly beings. Uh, as you can see, when uh, all the fabrics are closed, uh, it, uh, um, uh, it represents the shape of the uh, wings of the butterfly or bees. Uh, in the second slide, uh, we can see the uh, changes of the light when it's open or when the fabrics are open or when they are closed and uh, the, the changes in the light. And uh, uh, the uh, next slide is showing, uh, is, uh, showing uh, uh, based on the activity because we have the uh, screen in the left uh, wall uh, as if, if Elena can show, yeah. Uh, we have the screen over there. So if uh, a student wants to present something, if they want to uh, use the screen, they can close the fabric in the first three windows. So the amount of light that is in the classroom is reduced. So it's darker, it's better for presenting. Uh, but if they need uh, to make model or uh, need to more, have more light, they can close them and uh, make the classroom completely uh, bright. So here we jump into the structure and the material that we're using. Uh, the habitats would be made of acrylic, preferably the, the green cast, which is a, a, a recycled acrylic uh, for obvious reasons, to be able to see inside the habitats, uh, but also we're doing them with different colors so that uh, it filters in the light into the studio, creating different moods and, and um, effects depending on the time of day and season. And also the fabric would be absorbing that light and reflecting it in different ways as well. So the fabric is a stretchable four-way uh, lycra or uh, spandex is the general name. Uh, we picked a white or neutral tone just to be able to absorb the, the lighting quality when it comes in. And the stretchability of it is uh, 
so that the students can interact with it and, and, and become really literally performatic. Also, it's inexpensive, it's washable, it's easy to replace. So we thought it was a good idea to have it in, in, in a studio uh, ambience and it could be opaque or it could be also be a more sheer uh, kind of stretch, stretchy material. The structure, here is a, a powder coated steel that would be fastened onto the walls. Uh, on the interior side of the, of the studio, we are not wanting to, to interfere at all with the exterior facade since it's a historical, historical building. There are million issues and we cannot touch it. So the only interference would be actually on the window pane that would be replaced by the habitat block. And um, the powder coating also is a, is a, more, it's a, there are no VOCs and so it's an environmental friendly um, material that we're using here. On this, this is a facade from the outside, so from, from the exterior uh, view, and it's showing the placement of the, the habitats. We place the, the flying animals, so the birds and the bees on the top layer, so that, would, uh, so that would allow the students to view all of what's going on, but they wouldn't be able to prod it and it wouldn't be in a direct contact in that way so that, so that they wouldn't disturb the animals. Um, then the, the blue here is the, the viewing boxes that we were, we were planning, we are planning actually to put our filters there so that the students uh, can actually see outside with the study that we did in our filter. So they would, it would be a simulation of how the, the birds and, uh, I mean, sorry, the, the bees, butterflies see the outer world. And the bottom layer are the tools for the tools. So it's a tool habitat. So it's a, um, it's a useful object for the students, and um, and they can, can they can still use the box while filtering the light and being a, a useful object for them as well. Great. Great. So as Elena mentioned, the Goldsmith Building is historic, and the construction was completed in 1933. Um, so because the facade is historic, our proposed intervention is minimal, and we believe. But the benefits of these habitats, like having them there, outweighs any of the risk of interfering in the facade because we're trying to think beyond the anthropocentric lens and place priority on insects um, in addition to old buildings. So the first habitat that we designed for birds um, is always located at the top of the window. Each bird habitat features perforated holes on both sides for cross ventilation because it can get very hot here in, te um, in Texas. And uh, each habitat also features different size diameter openings uh, to accommodate various local birds. So for example, the local blue jay requires a minimum diameter of one and a half inches. And since birds like to make their own nests, the interior of all the bird habitats is empty. Um, the next habitat is for bees and they're also located higher up. And each bee habitat is made from a transparent fluorescent acrylic that will glow under UV light. So if a UV light was placed there, it could glow at night. Uh, we studied leaf cutter bees, the dark sweat bee, and sunflower bees, just to name a few in the beginning of the semester, and found that most of these local bees, um, they actually don't make honey, they don't live in hives. Uh, many of them isolated and they even live underground. So each one of the species that we design accommodates their unique nesting preferences. So um, for example, one of the habitats features two wooden nesting walls, another features a wooden nesting block, and the third features nesting tubes made from cardboard. Um, because actually bee species prefer to be by themselves, you wouldn't see different species um, together. So we have different habitats to accommodate the different species. And the tool habitat also is a toolbox, is always located at the bottom for easy access um, right above the proposed workspace. And it can hold drafting tools and also allow students to visually connect with the Goldsmith Courtyard. Um, and the exterior of the toolbox, along with the other boxes, serves as a resting spot for any flying insect or animal. Um, the viewing boxes allow students to look into the Goldsmith Courtyard through the eyes of an insect. And each one of the filters that we designed was adapted and modified to fit within um, the facade of Goldsmith. So while each filter is unique, we all are representing bee color vision um, because bees see 
blue and purple best, green not so much, and red very poorly. So we're now going to go in and show you each filter. So the first filter, it's uh, my design. In my design, I was uh, inspired by the structure of the bee's eyes. Each bee has uh, two uh, component eyes that they uh, are made up of many guiding tube called omatidia. As you can see, uh, the top drawing, uh, the middle one is uh, showing the structure of the bee's eyes and uh, it's comparing that with the human eyes. If we want to see uh, our environment like bees, uh, how our eyes uh, would be look like, uh, the size and the shape of that. These omatidias are the reason that the bees can see their surrounding uh, pixelated and kind of uh, optical. In my design, I'm using uh, eight uh, layer of the clear acrylic that each of them have the pattern of the whole uh, uh, um, whole uh, S square that are as, uh, getting a smaller in each layer. So uh, when they are uh, stacked on top of each other, I don't know if it's clear and you can see it or not, but uh, they are uh, creating a shape of the pyramid. So it's kind of uh, make it possible for us to have a, uh, have a same uh, vision after uh, uh, like the bees and see uh, through the uh, environment like them. Um, so bee vision is much more distorted than human vision and humans can see 100 times more clear than bees. Um, and vision is uh, unique between each species as a result from adaptations from the environment over long periods of time. So my filter represents three things, visual distortion, acuity, and insect color vision. Um, a series of zigzag lines creates a 2D pattern with a false ridge that appears 3D. And the middle does appear to bulge higher, but it is flat. And the overall pattern is created from both the blurry lines and the space between the lines. So the first study I did was on a piece of blue acrylic, um, and it's just showing color vision and uh, visual distortion. And then I moved in and did some studies with the dichroic film. Um, so when I turn it left and right, you can see it, um, the lighting effects of this. And then the final filter designed is made from polygol, which is a layered plastic material. Um, and I took the pattern and stretched it out and then folded it to create an additional layer of distortion. So the middle image shows when you look at the filter from straight on, it appears to look neat and organized. And then as soon as your vision turns, all of the lines start to look very wacky and distorted. Um, and then the printed pattern is also featuring greens, blues, and purples to really represent the color vision. And lastly, uh, my filter it talks about also the, the shift in, in visual receptors that the, the bees use to uh, find the flowers and the nectar. So they use chromatic and achromatic stimulus. Uh, so that is to say when they're flying far away, they mostly see blurry blue uh, achromatic uh, vision. And they use the, the uh, they're, looking, they're looking at patterns and edges to, and contrast to detect where the flowers are. And once, uh, once they get closer to the flower, the, the achromatic cues are ignored, and then the chromatic visions come to guide and to, for them to find where the nectar is. So uh, my filter explored this visual shift in, in color and acuity, and um, I'm going to show it to you here. Uh, so I was, I, I was trying to buy the, this bulge, I don't know if you can see it properly, um, to simulate this zooming in that the, the vision does, and by placing different uh, colors and iridescent filters uh, represent the, the UV uh, lighting that they see. And uh, in the pictures, you can see how the, the, the light plays with this, um, with this contrasting and, and different lighting. And so this is the, the vision of the courtyard, how the, it shows how the protrusions of the, the habitats allow for all the like nuisance or bird droppings to fall down onto the flowers and plants below so it doesn't also doesn't touch the, the historical facade of the building and also feeds the, the, the cycle of, of the environment so um, we we are proposing uh, our proposal actually is to go beyond just viewing the insects 
uh, but actually providing the help habitats and welcoming them to live among us, you know, and uh, so that we're shifting the primary use of the building for humans only to a holistic view of the environment, uh, which has to include the other species, as we know that they, they don't depend on us as much as we depend on them. So we want to um, create more, more um, opportunities for them to live. And on the left, there's a list of the local pollinators and beneficial plants that could be used in the courtyard to feed them and for them to be able to feed us as well. And that's what we have. <laughs> Well, I, I just had a question um, just to jump in, which is, well, first to say, like, I really enjoyed your project and I think the, like the research, but just kind of what you're proposing is really interesting and has a lot of um, kind of, I think really interesting characteristics to it. But my, my one question is, is, or maybe it's like, a, well, yeah, it's a question, which is wh whether or not you, did you try any other like ways in which to engage the windows. And what I mean is obviously you talked about how each of the boxes is different in terms of its type and how it produces a particular habitat related to the particular uh, species. But I just wonder, did you try or explore any other options in terms of its not just its form, but that's certainly part of it. I mean, obviously it's related to the existing window and the, those dimensions. And I guess maybe that's really the heart of my question is, you know, you made a choice, I guess, to maintain those dimensions and work within them. But I am kind of wondering if you didn't do that, would these things really change? Or would it, or is what you've proposed like would work perfectly well and meet all the criteria that you, you set for yourself? Well, I think that certainly if we follow the, the grid, but in different dimensions, it could be add another layer of interest as well, having the rectangular boxes. And we did start with that. Uh, we were only considering the least intervention to the, to the exterior facade because of, I don't know, it was a limiting factor in a way um, so that we wouldn't really touch the exterior facade. I know, I mean, it wouldn't be touching the facade per se, but the actual window. So we, we limited ourselves to these boxes in that context, but I think it would perfectly work if we did a tall one, for example, a bat could come in and live there and you know we could accommodate yeah. for different animals. Well, that's that's the other part of it too, is that, okay, maybe, you, maybe it is that dimension that you work with, but then once you insert something, either, right, the only place where you have to maintain that dimension is where the object interfaces directly with the window. Once it moves beyond that, it could, yeah, it could sort of turn and get bigger, it could go out further, it could get it could open up more. Like it seems like the form of these boxes has some potential once you move beyond where it interfaces directly. And I think on, on one level, you have really challenged that on the interior, I think, with the use of this other kind of system of um, stretchy fabric, which I really like some of the effects and just the qualities that you produce with that on the interior. And yeah, like there's something kind of amazing just in terms of like seeing these things, almost even just as sculpture, as objects, and they kind of they have a presence and a and a are they like um, they they kind of amplify an experience of the space, and and I really like that. And I guess maybe I'm speaking then mostly about the exterior, or whether or not maybe just those boxes, you know, whether or not there's a potential there that could also be explored in terms of how they might amplify certain things. Maybe it's all about the habitat and, and you use that to drive the form or the um, even the configuration a little bit more. I mean, right now, also every pair of windows has the same, there are different locations and I understand your stratification, that kind of makes sense. But at the same time, you know, it's four boxes per set of windows. It's never like you get two or three of them right together because you have a really big colony mm -hmm. of, you know, or a certain kind of bird that likes to nest in close to one another or something like that. So I feel like there's a little bit of an opportunity there that hasn't maybe yet been fully explored, which could, um, I don't know, which could simply just be a kind of another variable, I guess, to consider. 
I had the same um, same kind of responses that Ryan did about uh, the size. I noticed all of them are at, what eight and a half by eleven. Um, the boxes and it looks like on the interior of the bee habitats that you've you know changed up you know broken it um, up more um, also but I, I would agree being able to give more variation there um, to uh, to where that happens right because so really you're kind of this division of the mullions you've kept um, and haven't on um, maybe that exterior changed it um, I would say you could even change it on the interior potentially too, especially if you have like multiple viewing boxes. Um, I think that's a possibility also um, to be able to think about the multiple viewing boxes as being able to create a, uh, a variation of them also on the interior too. Um, one other thing uh, I wanted to ask about was um, the, uh, the perspective and the viewing boxes and the depth Right. Are there so when we look at in viewing boxes, uh, I know the visual acuity and the change in details of up close versus further away is something that a lot of these um, insects you've been looking at have. So is there anything with these viewing boxes that was done or experimented with that could maybe respond to that? Did you guys try anything like that? Some of the challenges were that originally our filters were like two feet by one foot. So when we how to put them in we kind of had to like prop them and scale them down you know to fit within that eight and a half by eleven but i think to your earlier comment i think if we were to explore different sizes of boxes and even like if they were coming out of the frame and opening up we could have you know put new perspectives in the viewing boxes and kind of added another layer of dimension there yeah 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 and i think also that how that dimension ends up being created with the fabric in that transition um, could be even more sophisticated in that sense, like, you know, where those edges meet, what, what direction those are, right, of that acrylic versus, you know, the fabric. Can the acrylic actually explore beyond the box and somehow feel like it's more fluid with how it meets with the actual um, fabric? Unless there's a specific reason you need it to meet that way, right, to provide emphasis on something or distinction or contrast. Um, but I do think that the boxes could become um, potentially a, a little bit more integrated within kind of these planes because they're very rectilinear, like, mm -hmm. you know, very perpendicular to the window, right? And then you have this introduction of these oblique lines coming through into um, kind of this space, right, of with the fabric itself. And I'm just wondering how that could be maybe pushed more and thoughts about that, about how that could be pushed more, those two items maybe coming together. Yeah, also if maybe they would you know, look up on the exterior, they, they would absorb a light in, the different, in a different manner. So it could, you know, make more use of sunlight. And, uh, and we even thought about making them as jewels almost in the, in the end, uh, in the interior where they could, you know, even hone in a little bit more. So I think there's a lot of space for changing, it's especially I think with acrylic or the, you know, you see, I don't know how easy it is really to make uh, non-messy glue there because we tried and it was a challenge <laughs> but there's definitely room for exploration on different positions and sizes and and shapes of the of the habitat in itself yeah between a heat bender and you know acrylic glue um definitely uh i think you could get it but yeah acrylic glue definitely is a, a trial <laughs> and error kind of thing for sure um i also think elena um you know your work really stood out initially in the um like early on explorations because of that three dimensionality and all, again, kind of the integration of that single like flat plane all of a sudden coming out right into a surface and forming. I mean, that's kind of what I'm getting at with like how these are shaped, these boxes and this material, how they're shaped, the fabric material shaped together. Um, and uh, the, the, of my filter. Yeah, the bulbous kind of portion of your filter. Yeah, where yeah. it seems like there's like, it's not immediate, right? Um, and if it is immediate, why is it immediate? Why is there such a kind of dramatic change between like this really rectilinear perpendicular to these oblique lines? Um, or is there a reason to get to soften it more, right? Um, that transition of that experience maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, so we could have made a like almost like a a window that you could stick your head in. That's what the initial concept of my, my filter was actually. So it would apply that to the to the filter and the not as the obvious plane, but as a bulb would be interesting as well. 
Yeah, because I also think with the viewing boxes, there's a level of which you can create like things that may appear lower, but actually are higher. Like there's all these, these you know, past kind of precedents on um, kind of perspectives. There's actually a movie, I forget the name of it offhand, but um, I believe it's a young lady who's, who's autistic and she's on a, you know, she studies, studies cattle farming and so forth, but she looks at these kind of weird boxes and like how the perspective changes um, based upon kind of where she's placed in this shadow box in this viewing box. And it's a complete distortion of where she actually is placed, right? So this idea of kind of acuity and within relationship to, to, the, to the shape of that box and how you can see the outside world from that interior um, while also thinking of them as habitats, I think could be really interesting. Yeah, definitely. Um, I'll jump in here sure. and say that uh, I think it's a really fascinating proposal and um, especially having spent so much time in this particular space together with Grace, Elena, and Marjan. Um, this feels like a second home in a way. Uh, I was a little bit confused initially about the fabric structure because it almost seemed like you were, and maybe you, I don't know, it almost seemed like you were creating internal connections between the different boxes so that, you know, one, if you were an insect in one box, you could travel to another box from sort of the interior. But then I don't think that's quite what you were envisioning with it. Marjan? Uh, from the uh, insects, the box is individual. They're not connected to each other. Right. They are connected by fabric, and fabrics are movable. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I'm struggling a little bit with the fabric because it feels almost like, a, like an added system that you don't necessarily need um, that in some ways takes away and I think it takes away a little bit from the boxes. I do love the, the adaptability and flexibility that it offers to people within the space to be able to adjust, um, especially since we've taken away the possibility of opening the windows. Um, so we've kind of taken away one way to adapt the space, but provided another way. Um, but the other thing that I really want to comment on is, is it seems a little bit like this is uh, in my book, I talk a bit about challenging provocations. And to me, this seems like one of those instances where we really are kind of pushing people's perceptions and their willingness to accept something like this. Because having spent a lot of time in this space, I know that we have not been very accepting of having insects be present. Especially, right? <laughs> so, I mean, there's like a, you know, all out war against getting rid of crickets. Oh. And in these spaces and, and lots of, you know, terrible things happening to these poor crickets in the space and, you know, lots of frustration about, you know, noises and, you know, things happening that are, that are just driven by nature. And, and then here we are kind of inviting those things to kind of actually occupy. Well, we're not, act, we're being very selective about what we're inviting to occupy, but at the end of the day, we're still inviting insects and birds to kind of like come in and, and, and inhabit these spaces where we have often been trying to keep them out. So I, I just think it's really, it's fascinating because it, it's a challenge in and of itself to, to try and overcome those kinds of perceptions. And I'm curious if that crossed your mind as you were developing the proposal. Oh, it did because everybody was like, I don't want bugs and time. <laughs> Well, while we were researching, that's what I was saying about demystifying the, uh, this, you know, not wanting bugs and insects, oh, don't touch me, and into the, in, I mean, you're going to be it's like, literally on your face, right? So, and, but then if you see them laying the eggs and then, you know, become a larva and then find out, and uh, it would kind of, you would empathize with it and see that uh, it's not that bad after all, <laughs> and then we have to it's live with it. It's kind of interesting because they are next to you, but there is a filter between you and them. So you are safe, but you can see how they live and kind of you are connected with them. It gives you that uh, feeling that you are outside, but you are inside. It's kind of very interesting for us. Yeah. yeah that's, we like kept going back and forth on like, is this inside or outside? And so this is challenging our ideas, like what it means to be inside. Because if the box is, you know, it's in the interior, but it's outside, it kept us going back and forth on what it means to be inside and outside. Well, I keep thinking about the acoustic qualities, qualities of these. So the kind of buzzing, the rustling, the chirping, 
Um, and, you know, in some ways I, I enjoy having a bird's nest outside of my office window and I'm always kind of checking on the progress. But, you know, it's just, it's an interesting thing in this whole other layer of kind of what it means to have sort of a living creature um, sort of invited to be embedded in the building. And so I, I think in a lot of ways you are challenging perceptions on that. And um, I think that's, you know, part, part of your proposal. So really kind of embracing that and celebrating it, I think is important. As this as a like a, um, a space, you know, uh, it was brought up the last um, presentation about kind of what happens in this space and maybe it's not where it's high time for studying, getting th things done. I mean, if you have an hour in that space, right, it takes you probably like 15 minutes to set up. <laughs> so, you know, you then, then the breakdown, maybe another 15 minutes. So maybe you really only have 30 minutes in this space. Um, I think uh, what um, Tammy was saying about the um, acoustical qualities, I almost wonder if you could play that up and you could mic these boxes and you could think of them as I'm looking at it, it looks very mechanical with the fabric. You could think of them as channels, right? Where people could turn kind of a channel on and off um, and they could listen to things and they couldn't listen to things, right? Mm -hmm. uh, maybe there's headphones in these spaces or something um, or it's a Bluetooth, right? Where people can plug into this Bluetooth um, like sound and, and put channel one and two on because they know that it's the green and the orange, right? That they may want to hear simultaneously. It's a whole new white noise approach. Totally, totally. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I was also intrigued by that potential. And um, there's a project, it's, uh, I don't know when it would have been, early 2000s that uh, Francois Roche designed, which was a house I think it's called the bottleneck house, if I remember correctly. And it's a house for a, for a, for an individual who was like, I think it's a set in Trinidad and Tobago. And it's like a, a, for an individual who was very concerned about getting malaria or something. And the house is like both an attractor of mosquitoes and it attracts them. And there's like this double layer and this way for them to come in. And then it effectively kills them. But at the same time, it's all transparent. So like when you're living in this house, you can also see them between these surfaces and they're buzzing and you can even like feel them, but they're also getting kind of neutralized. And so there's this like kind of twisted, almost perverse relationship between, you know, this perceived threat, but then also living kind of literally inside this bubble and, and kind of seeing, seeing them very close, but also not, you know, not able to kind of harm you. So. I don't know if you want to go go there, but the auditory thing reminds that me of like the potential to kind of mess even with the sound a little bit. Like if you did have it mic'd up and you did have speakers in certain places and you know you're walking through and you hear these noise of scurrying or birds kind of like you know fledgling around at certain places, does that sort of totally or radically change the kind of spatialization of the of the environment just through through the amplification of these these kind of sounds and things, so I don't know. I mean, that's sort of again maybe kind of like perverse or or maybe um, uh, I don't know a kind of like different way to think about it. But it but it would really force one to engage with it in a way that we we don't normally want to or that we see as a very negative thing. I guess as the crickets maybe get on everybody's nerves after a while. So. Um, <laughs> But as a potential, it certainly could be interesting, um, I would imagine. And you could play with the fabrics more with that point too, right? Throughout the space, they could become, um, it could become more about acoustics and the fabric and, you know, the sound absorption or reflection um, within that space too, um, to where you begin to create spaces based upon um, how much sound is in there, what the sound is like, uh, maybe what will be done in that space. Um, so then the, the, the fabrics become uh, more of an integral part that come almost off that, uh, that system into the, the rest of the space. Um, do you guys have, I mean, I don't know if you guys have any final comments. Uh, it seems like uh, maybe that's, uh, <laughs> that's it. Uh, <laughs> we only have uh, two projects this, uh, in this uh, first half, uh, so 
if there's only so much uh, we can talk about. I think I agree to all the comments that they're opening. So like very interesting uh, avenues as to how to continue to develop uh, your proposals uh, in being more multi-sensory um, and also challenging some of the decisions that you have taken for granted, no? like uh, like the mere extrusion of the box, and this, which I think it's particularly apparent in these new sections that you started doing that, uh, for example, if the box is very up high, those those uh, bird uh, habitats, no, they they would not really be, a, you wouldn't really be able to see inside them, no, from below, unless maybe it's chamfered at a certain angle in the inside the box, no. So how do you, how do you, if that's a desire, um, uh, then 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 they would require further uh, fine tuning, no, of, of the design. Uh, but I think, uh, yeah, I, th I, I really appreciate in this uh, proposal how you were trying to integrate uh, thinking of the insects as a larger part of the ecosystem, no, uh, and how that affects uh, their their effect their effect on other species and also on the um, on the planters in the courtyard, etc. No. Uh, so really great job. Um, I uh, again the the comments of the critics were great. Um, I don't know if you want to uh, have maybe some closing comments uh, for this first half. Um, I have uh, some questions um, just as for all the groups together. Um, you know, when I was going through the projects earlier, um, and it may be shown later on in the next half, um, did any of you kind of test within your design work this idea? I know you tested obviously distortion and um, clarity, right, um, of details versus uh, things being blurred and very 8-bit-like, but did you all um, investigate the idea of magnification and how that can change? Um, and then my other question is just to based upon how do you see your design being flexible for the future also of that space so the two part questions about magnification and exploration of that and then the flexibility of the design for the future of the space so in terms of magnification there's a team that was looking at that do you guys want to talk a little bit about the yours uh, our group i'm assuming <laughs> <laughs> um yeah we we um we were interested in ours in contrasting the the low resolution that um, bees see um, with um, how they perceive when they finally, you know, um, reach these flowers and start pollinating them. So we use magnifying acrylic to contrast that vision. Okay, um, great. And then the the other question, just in regards to you know the future of kind of what how this will will be experienced right in this space um the ever-changing future that we have uh with regards to experience in space um is there any way to kind of allow for flexibility within the designs for that you mean do you mean in terms of maintenance or use or different uses of the space and um uses or? yeah it could be uses of the space it could be um kind of uh some of the students had like ability to put maybe certain things in certain areas like could this somehow be modular and being changed out um mm -hmm. uh, with a flexibility to it based upon who may be the user of the space or what may be the function of the space also mm -hmm. we do have a team also that was addressing <laughs> that a little more specifically no uh, this uh, modularity and the ability of uh of uh, students to be able to transform or or at least uh, maintain or 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 uh, keep the proposal, uh, no, uh, repair the proposal if broken or something, no. You guys want to talk about that a bit? Um, yeah. So uh, me, Anna, and Hannah, our group is going uh, last, <laughs> but um, our intervention is designed specifically and purposefully so that the materials inside can be replaced. Um, we'll go into more detail once we present, but there is a wooden insert where the bees are able to um, live and nest. And that usually goes okay for about two years. And then afterwards, um, they need to be changed out just to be cleaned, um, stuff like that. So um, in that way, our installation is able to stand the test of time and not just be something that's you keep there for like a year or two and it goes away. 
I definitely think the the feasibility of the the first project we saw um, and its kind of insertion into that space um, is uh, something that uh, is capable of being done for sure. Some of the kind of mechanics of the fabrics in the second project, um, I think would have to be a little bit more realized, right? That function. And then also the user even understanding like how that's supposed to be used, right? Um, what do I pull and do I even touch this, right? It seems so intricate that I'm not sure that I should even interact with it. Um, so I do think there's a little bit more for, for that project that might need to happen. Um, I think overall, you know, the, the project that your professor Nerea gave you all uh, was very exciting <laughs> and, you know, something that you could really be super creative with and the research component of it and the, uh, you know, working with um, the biology department, I think is just fascinating. Um, and also for you as designers to understand that component of research with biology and not just, you know, another design, um, a design, a discipline. Uh, is super important as you move ahead um, for the future of your work. So I, I want to commend you on you all taking on this huge task, um, especially during this time, right? Um, but I also think, you know, thinking of habitats is something maybe that, you know, you could reflect upon even now, right? Um, with us in quarantine and kind of what that might feel like a habitat for even, you know, us right now um, in these spaces, um, in these cubes, these shadow boxes even. <laughs> Thank you. Maybe Ryan has some closing comments, but I, I would like to just say to the to everyone, I won't get to see you at graduation. So it's been really wonderful working with all of you. And I think this is a this seems like a really fun, uh, playful project to end your time at UT on. And I hope that I hope that it's been enjoyable and um, congratulations. <laughs> Yeah, I guess I was just going to say I might hold off on mine because uh, I know I'm on the, the second half review as well, so I don't want to be redundant. But um, what I would say, maybe just specific to these two projects, I think, you know, uh, I think you guys did a really phenomenal job going so far in such a short amount of time. I mean, two and a half weeks is not much time. And both these projects, I yeah, sure, a few questions, but I do think had some like clear potential in terms of feasibility. And I could imagine if you had resources, you could apply them and get them, you know, in some way built up over the summer or whatnot, or even uh, more quickly. So I would just say like, I think it's nice to see such resolution in, in a really short period of time. And I think that speaks to obviously the studio in general, the process that you've taken, because obviously much of your proposals were built on the research you, 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 you did earlier in the semester. So I think, that, that I'm sure helped your, your process and made it kind of feasible to get so far in just a pretty short amount of time. So at least these two projects, I'm sure it will be the same for the next two as well, but I commend you guys for that uh, specifically. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you so much uh, for your time, uh, Felicia, Ryan, and Tammy. Um, and then uh, maybe we take a break uh, and reconvene uh, at three, so we have a little extra time, but uh, yeah, uh, see you later. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Bye. Yeah. So, so yeah, uh, I think the students, you know, all the critics already, but uh, then for you that you don't know each other, so Ryan is joining us from uh, the University of Cincinnati. Um, and, uh, and Joyce, uh, she's an assistant professor there. Joyce is an associate professor and associate chair at the University at Buffalo. And then Clay is associate professor here uh, at, the, at uh, UT. Uh, all of you know the project already. The only thing, uh, but you don't know this particular face because nobody has seen it. The students basically started working on this two weeks and a half ago. So if, half if we count this week. Uh, so it's been, a, it, it was like a very short kind of charrette exercise um, where the students uh, try to synthesize the ideas that they've been 
uh, working with you in the semester and the explorations that they had done in different media through the hands-on and uh, more material fabrication explorations that they did at first with the filters and uh, in trying to materialize insect vision through those means to the more um, digital ones that they did for the video uh, for Fusebox uh, virtual edition. Um, and then uh, compiling all of that and with the extra review week, this exercise got really shortened, but the whole purpose of this exercise was that, um, the, the, that it was also an actual project where they could apply those, um, those findings that they had done in the development of the lenses. Uh, because there was uh, the ambition of the university to refurbish this one classroom in Goldsmith, which is one of uh, the architecture buildings in campus. Uh, so the students uh, were going to do, the, and we had done uh, something similar uh, a couple of years ago, two years ago, where uh, there was a, a refurbishment of a couple of classrooms in, in another building of the architecture school and the students were invited to uh, contribute one piece in the space and they did a, a wall intervention so this time we were invited to consider an intervention in the classroom but then during this whole COVID thing this uh, this project has been also placed on hold it was going to start construction this summer but right now it's not clear at all if it will happen at all so because of this um, so uh, still the interventions, are, so it was, it's a short project, but they should be feasible and they are modest in the scope. Uh, well, some more than others, because since we didn't have uh, in the end so much the constraints of a uh, constructability or immediate construct constructability, uh, I allowed them to uh, uh, be a bit more ambitious in cases when they when they wanted to. So, um, but they, they should be explaining that, uh, and I think uh, where the project is and everything should be clear from um, uh, their presentation. So with that, we're gonna see uh, three projects. The, the studio is a combination of students, uh, undergrads and uh, grads, both interior designers and architects. Um, and uh, we're gonna see a kind of a mix of everything uh, in, the, in terms of student populations also uh, to this afternoon. Um, and, uh, and, and I think with that, uh, maybe we can get started. Uh, Baxter, uh, so uh, just um, from the previous, um, uh, the previous half, uh, when you guys, uh, well, in the chat section, you guys can see that they uploaded this slide show from Google. So if you want to uh, scroll through the drawings, you should be able to access it there. Baxter, which is who is part of this first team, has uploaded their presentation, but they're gonna make it live now. Um, and, and just for the other teams, remember to do that because in the first half it didn't work so well because you need to allow open access in your Google Docs. Uh, in that otherwise it requires you to um, give explicit per permission to who you want to share the document with. So um, please notice that uh, before you upload the next set of documents, okay? So um, otherwise you can also access everything on UT Box uh, that I sent you the link via email as well, um, in case there were any issues with the connection. But I think uh, with that, we may just be able to get started. Sorry, um, I have to stop sharing, share again. Okay. <clears throat> okay, um, so this is Baxter, Payton, and I's project. So it's called Insect Lens, focusing on their world, and it's a proposal for an interior window intervention. It's comprised of different acrylic, um, clear acrylic pieces that are layered on top of each other, and it's attempting to bring it, um, attention to the presence of local pollinators. So the site of our project, which is Goldsmith Hall, is considered to be a historic building. So our group chose to only really intervene on the interior of the studio to try to preserve the nature of the historic facade. So continuing from the research we did in the first part of the semester about insect vision, we were incorporating the aspect of vision acuity into, into our uh, window filter pr project. 
So acuity refers to the fineness of resolution of the eye, which is in bees is about 100 that of humans. So we began with the image of this flower. You can see on the left, which is a flower in the courtyard and um, abstracting that image digitally to increase the pixel size by 100 um, to try to attempt to perceive at these visions fineness of resolution. So from this, we got the pixel size of about 1.5 times 1.5 inches and we use this to create pixelation in the filter. You can go to, yeah. um, to achieve the perception of bees vision resolution, we etched these fine lines into clear acrylic sheets using the defined pixel size. These etched lines blur the appearance of objects at the 1.5 scale to try to perceive the world as a bee would in regard to acuity. Um, these etched lines also create an interesting visual effect when there's movement with um, light in the background as light is refracted with the, within the layers of the etched lines. And also it helps to further obstruct our vision to try to perceive the world as a bee would. Um, this effect from the first part of the semester was meant mostly to represent an insect's ability to see polarized vision or polarized light. But for our window uh, adaptation, the edge lines are mainly to define the 1.5 inch grid and to reduce visual acuity. Abby, do you have the, uh, you, are you gonna show us some of the images from those material studies? Yeah, we have a video right after this. So this um, oh, okay. slide is pretty much just to try to show the scale of the grid in relation to like the full window size. And then Baxter, you can go to the next one. Yeah, it so, might be kind of jerky because of the lag, but. <laughs> yeah, it might be easier to view it if you like opened up the PDF separately, but. So this video is a small sample of um, the filter that I created from the first part of the semester and can kind of help to uh, be used to help visualize the effect of the etched lines on the acry acrylic and limiting in vision acuity. We integrated um, similar etched lines to what is shown here in our group's window adaptation design. So in, um, while we are lowering the resolution of an observer's vision to be that of an insect, specifically bees, um, we want to conversely allow people interacting with our installation to closely observe the flowering tree near our, uh, near our installation as well. Um, so we're, in addition to these etched pieces, we are using pieces of magnifying acrylic, which will allow um, observers in the studios to perceive the flowers similarly to how bees uh, perceive flowers as they approach closely to pollinate them, and as well as to literally watch um, these insects as they work to pollinate these flowers. Um, and you can see here like a closer view um, of how this would work, creating this sort of mosaic of um, regular clear uh, acrylic that's etched to lower acuity, and then um, these pieces that magnify the flowers so that you can perceive them closely. And um, so we wanted to create this contrast between a bee's long field vision as well as their vision close to the flowers um, to bridge the gap between our vision and theirs. And another um, feature of this magnification is that at night, uh, studio light passing through these convex magnifying pieces would be refracted and converged. So just a little physics um, refresh. This is um, representing a convex magnifying lens. So when light passes from one side to the other, it's refracted and converges at a certain point. So we are trying to generate these um, patches of intense focused light on the flowers of the tree themselves. Um, and this is in order to create light stimuli, uh, stimuli that could um, bring um, nocturnal insects that ha have positive photaxis, which is um, a natural inclination towards light um, that evolutionarily developed from them, um, from insects such as moths orienting themselves to the moon at night. Um, but since we have artificial light now, um, uh, their positive photaxis often draws them to these dangerous situations where they're um, either like burning on artificial lights or uh, people create light traps to actually kill these um, moths because they see them as pests. But we're trying to generate this light on a positive um, area where they can actually, you know, perform tasks that they should be doing naturally um, instead of creating, you know, um, an unnecessary diversion that they are confused by. 
Um, and you can see here kind of how that works in real life. Like if you've ever seen, ironically, like a cartoon of somebody holding a magnifying glass up to like an ant or something to burn it, it creates this patch of focus light. So we're trying to create that similar effect on the leaves of the tree itself. Um, Okay, so um, we were thinking about a way for people um, inside the studio to be able to view the moss that are drawn to the tree. Um, and since these moss would be concentrated around the spots of light when it's dark outside, uh, we thought about using thermal imaging as a way to capture that activity. Um, and so we did some research on how insects would look under an infrared camera. And we found that um, even though they're cold blooded, nesters swarms of insects do generate enough heat to be detected by a thermal camera. Um, so this camera would be nested on the nearby windowsill and it would record the canopy of the tree and the swarms of insects that are uh, drawn to those areas of intense light. Um, and you can go to the next slide. Um, and so then this footage would be played as a live feed on a screen that is mounted inside the studio. Um, and so this render is showing that screen that's inset into the wall um, and how that infrared footage might look. And so at night, the footage would be played. And then during the day, the screen could be used as a digital pinup space or presentation screen for the studio. So um, we would imagine that because this screen is so large, it would be pretty expensive, but it would be really cost effective for the studio because um, when it's not being used to view insects, it could be really functional. Um, and traditionally, this method of using thermal imaging on insects is used for pest control. So um, using it as a way for people to view them could uh, help us better understand them and uh, could potentially help change how we view the species. Um, you can go to the next slide. So zooming out a bit, um, this is a site elevation showing the north facade and uh, the orange is highlighting the windows that were that we chose to intervene in. And um, our main concepts that we've been talking about all play off of the tree, which is uh, situated in front of the leftmost window here. Um, and so we chose to intervene in these specific windows because of their adjacency to that tree. On this page, uh, we can see a basic plan of the studio space. So again, the windows that are highlighted in orange are those that we'd be intervening in. And yeah, like this paint was saying, we primarily chose these windows because they're proximity to the Chinese magnolia tree that's in the courtyard. And this would be the best place to filter a view to the courtyard to attract insects and also um, to be the focus of the thermal imaging camera. So with this plan, you can see, um, see the location of where the camera would be mounted on the building um, and also the location of that um, multi-purpose presentation screen. Also, sorry to interrupt, can you go back one second, since it's the first time that they look at the plan, this is the, so this is the plan as envisioned by the interior designers that uh, they're, uh, they, the, the, this is their proposal for the space, this is not how the space is right now, but the way they are thinking about it is that there will be the central spine of um, more office type desks where people work, uh, students work in their computers, and then notice in the perimeter there's this uh, long table by the windows uh, in, in uh, all, all along the, the perimeter of the courtyard. And then on the right hand side also next to the windows, those are for making models. So because normally in the studios we have uh, a sh shifting population of uh, students, uh, normally two studios, uh, but in different amounts of, of students, this was the, the solution that they came up with. So the students are adopting the, the plans from the interior designers. They didn't design the layout of the space uh, and they're intervening uh, with, or, or sometimes intentionally uh, changing it, but normally they have adopted uh, that uh, as part of their, the layout of the space. Okay, so um, we can see at the bottom, the west interior elevations, that would be the proposed design for um, the screen placement. And then uh, in the east elevation, which is the wall that's facing the Goldsmith Courtyard, we're showing an elevation of our overlapping acrylic pieces. Um, in relation to the tree, the design is most dense when it's closest to the tree in proximity, and then it decreases in density moving left. So the most dense window covering filters the view of the tree, and those with um, 
decrease in density reveal the view to the courtyard. And we have on the next um, page kind of an elevation of that trying to show um, the variant density on the design. So again, on the right, that would be the two windows with the most dense and then the middle is uh, like middle in density and then the left ones are the least dense. And then this is an interior render that's trying to capture the view of what it would, the design would look like during the day. Um, so it's magnifying in certain areas, parts of the tree to observe insects in their habitat as a, at a closer scale. And also the etched lines on it are trying to blur um, the view to observe the tree with acuity of an insect's vision. Uh, so we use this precedent image on the right to start off in our process of generating how our acrylic assembly would come together while using Abby's sample that she showed earlier um, as our material reference. Um, and so we came up um, with this assembly that you saw in the render earlier of various interlocking pieces that situate in the existing window frames. So we're really just in, um, intervening mostly in the interior. Um, and uh, this assembly is combined, composed of both lucite uh, acrylic, which glows under LED light, as well as the magnifying acrylic that um, I talked about earlier. Um, and um, highlighted in this axon are where the magnifying pieces of ac acrylic would be. Um, as you can see, they taper off the farther away from the tree you get because it's not as necessary to show the tree up close um, with magnification. Uh, and here's just a closer view of how that assembly looks. Um, and then the rest of the pieces would be the lucite acrylic. Um, and so at night, we want this um, intervention to still have a purpose. Um, so we wanted to show it to the people in the courtyard. So as you saw in that first render, uh, after the studio lights go down and everybody has left the interior of the studio for the day, um, LED lights in the periphery of the frame would turn on automatically uh, and glow for about an hour or so, uh, and then automatically turn off to not waste electricity. Um, and this would just be a reminder to the people in the courtyard, um, showing the illuminated etching, um, showing the resolution that the insects see, but in a more subtle way. And in this axon, you can see the various uh, interlocking pieces that we used and how they fit together. Um, we're thinking we would probably need to use an adhesive of some sort um, in the end, but it's designed to be structurally stable on its own, but yeah. Um, and then this is showing structurally where uh, it nests into the frame. So we have this metal rod that would hook up into um, the existing indention in the frame as well as these pieces that um, slide into these slots at the bottom, to provide stability at the bottom as well. Uh, and here you can just see a closer section where the LED light would be, where that um, rod would be at the top, as well as the bottom. Uh, and so we were really just thinking how this assembly could play out through the day and how it would be dynamic throughout the day. Um, so we create this little timeline showing that um, during the day, it serves its purpose as showing the acuity as well as the magnification that um, uh, more closely show bees vision and other insects vision as they pollinate flowers. And then still in the afternoon, you would have the same effect. And then um, early on in the night, you would have the studio lights on while students are still working, uh, illuminating this tree and bringing moths to um, pollinate the tree at night. Uh, as well as once the studio lights go down and it's this more subtle um, LED glow late at night. Thank you. I had a quick question if I just jump in, I guess, if that's all right, which is, Obviously, I appreciate the thinking about different times of day and then the specificity of the, the flowering tree. But I, I guess maybe I have kind of two related questions. One is, did you consider like what happens at other times throughout the year when the tree is not in bloom, which presumably is the vast majority of the time, or simply 
when it's full of leaves versus when it's not, or I'm not sure the exact cycle. So maybe, maybe that would just be something to, to clarify. And then the other thing I was just gonna ask is relative to how the individual inserts change. You mentioned density as being something that changed and I guess the amount of magnification, but does the construction or does anything else about it change relative to its position of exactly which window? Because it seems like clearly the two windows, I guess, furthest to the east are like right in front of the tree. But then as you go west, the last two are actually quite, you know, relatively far away, or at least they're not in front. So I'm just wondering if if there are any other ways in which your installation varies to respond to that kind of relative change, in, again, in relationship to the tree. Um, in regard to the second question you kind of asked, I, f I guess the actual like construction of how the pieces come together doesn't change, but with the way that it's designed, like the ones further to the left would have like less overlapping pieces than the ones to the right just based on how the pieces actually have to come together, um, which I guess just um, is a different effect in like the filtering of the view into the courtyard. And those pieces that are further away from the tree would be less um, like obstructed or less filtered. Is that about the, the, well, I think building on that, on Ryan's question, because I think it's a very valid question because it talks about the, the temporal quality of the project and uh, as well as the sort of the subject, the who is the subject within the project. And so if it's about, you know, the vi you know, bug vision in terms of um, how visual acuity shifts uh, relative to the, the, the location of something that's drawing them, like the flower or something like this, then it makes sense. I mean, it, I, get this, I get this sense about like the, the, the density changing. I don't know what the effect actually is. Um, but I think also there's a, just like there should be some kind of like relation to, to the um, seasonal change. I, th I think the, you're kind of playing this up as sort of like an elevational project, and it, which to me is a counterintuitive notion to something that's about subjective vision, whether it's a, a moth or me, because I'm not, I don't experience the world in flat surfaces. I, I experience it in, in dynamic relation to stuff. And so like the, the oblique nature of the tree relative to the the window could be played up, and so like it could be about d density or thicken uh, thickening of the of the of the system, but also it could be about orientation of the system toward uh, you know in a tropic way toward the the thing that's supposedly drawing my attention if I'm sort of trying to feel like a moth for a day or something like this. And so like I think that that's the that's the, the next layer of, of, that's missing for me. Um, and it also is missing maybe a little bit in terms of um, uh, the sort of uh, the collagist kind of approach. Um, I don't know. I, I like the effect. I think it's a beautiful thing, by the way, this sort of like filigree. I think it's, I think it could get even finer in a lot of ways, but like if I, if it's a, if it's a different kind of set of criteria, then I could start to ask questions about like, uh, why would it be like split vision or is, are there multiple like uh, photo receptors in a, and, uh, and the moth's eye that allow it to see different levels of stuff, uh, which I have no idea, but like that kind of seems like what you're, what you're showing. And so like, I think those become really interesting questions um, that, that, that could push the project forward if it went you know, into sort of a design development phase. Um, and then the very last thing I'll say is like, I don't think you, and maybe it was a criteria, but I think privileging the window, you know, like keeping it at the frame to me, um, misses a little bit of an opportunity to um, affect the reading of the room that you're within relative to the thing outside the room and sort of the collapse or, this, or, the, or the blurring of the interior and the exterior through this vision um, that in some ways, especially in your projection idea, starts allows me to sort of see through things in a, in a slightly different way, right? So I can see in a, in a, in a spectra that I can't normally see but that maybe, maybe moths see an infrared. I know some butterflies do, but I don't know if moths do or not, but you know, like that kind of stuff, I think will be a way to kind of push it forward. Yeah, I mean, I, I was imagining the, um, that the construction potentially, you know, everything's orthogonal and that makes sense when you're, when it's directly in front of the tree, let's say. And I, I really do like the idea of kind of focusing the light and, and using this, um, 
like biological innate preference for you know the the color but also the intensity and then using that as a way as you explained to not kind of you know uh, draw them into you know a, a, an incandescent light or a kind of like bug zapper but to actually direct them to the place where maybe they want to go ultimately and so I would imagine that kind of works in the in the two windows on the east but as you move further away given the fact that the actual system doesn't really change I don't know how well it works in the other four windows but I could imagine that by simply changing the angle or like maybe it's the depth of the whole thing like you could you could calibrate your construction to to sort of impact where that light goes and direct it in a way, which then would also produce a little, little bit more specificity in those other other windows. Mm -hmm. So so I think um, so I think that could be that could be something definitely to explore a little bit further as how how each of these particular locations might Im impact the actual construction of. It. I mean, your system I think kind of works. It's just how that system then differentiates a bit relative to its exact location and to the exact effect, as well as the, the tree itself and the location of the tree. So it's a kind of like confluence of all these like spatial relationships. And somehow you're like almost there, you're like on the verge of it. And I really like the magnification. I think somehow that would play into it too. Like, I don't know exactly how, but it could get like, I don't know, like deeper where it's also more magnified. Like there could be a spatial registration of that magnification as well. I, I could imagine anyways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree with all of these comments. I'm actually scrolling through your PDF now, just looking at all the drawings and they're quite beautiful. I think that you have a really nice project and a really good hand in terms of composition and making images and drawings. Um, I am curious, yeah, so I'm, I also am curious about the composition. When I'm looking at the, the one, the elevation one that's kind of black and white, I think one thing that I'm just really curious about is like what, what is determining things like the density of these pieces and what type. And I, and I know that, um, that like looking again at, yeah, so it's the one, I think it's, it's the sort of black and white one. I can't see what slide number it is, but I'm sort of like, yeah, yes, this yeah. one. So what's interesting about this as well is like, is that the one on, aside from it being sort of sparse to dense, the one on the left looks almost kind of almost symmetrical. You know, there's this kind of weird kind of near symmetry going on where it doesn't quite happen as much in the second one. And then in the last one is kind of more dense and, and a little bit near symmetrical. And so there's something about symmetry that I didn't, I don't know if there's something about that that is impacting something. I don't know if you said something about that, but um, especially when you think about like the whole idea of like eyes and looking out and having two. Um, so anyway, so there was something about that. I, I think I agree with Brian's comment I, I about um, the kind of proximity to the tree. I think this idea of magnification is, is excellent. Um, I think that would be so fascinating to really, you know, project light in certain areas and to kind of induce swarming and like that's a really brilliant idea. I would love to actually see that happen and to see it happen through the kind of thermal imaging system. Um, but I'm wondering, like, does that, it, it would be interesting to test that. I know you, you haven't had, you haven't been able to, um, you know, really sort of like spend a, uh, time, you know, making things in, um, I mean, you do have the things that you made in reality, but it's, but there's also the kind of issue of like, you know, sustained testing, which you haven't been able to do. I would be interested to know, like, if you have a kind of spread across pattern, like what you're seeing there, does it create more like kind of small bits of magnification? Or are you actually able to create a larger glow of, of light? Um, and if that's the case, what would be the pattern, the kind of um, resulting pattern? Um, but I like the idea that the whole thing is a kind of feedback loop, I guess, to some extent that, you know, that this thing is, that, that it operates in different times of day and that you can, you know, have the lights are projecting out to the tree that attracts the bugs and then the, that kind of gets captured and kind of goes back into the room. So there's this kind of awareness back and forth. I think that's a really nice idea. Um, well, it's the, it's the promise of a feedback loop. It's not, it's yeah, not yes. we don't quite well, see, yeah. you know, we don't quite see the ecology of the whole thing yet, like from the human to the, to the, to the moth, to the tree, to the season, to the space, to the, to the, to the light, to the light source, to, you know, all that, all that complexity, which I think is super interesting. And that's what I like about the whole premise of this is that it, you know, if the, if the big premise is to sort of flatten 
uh, the hierarchy into sort of a post-humanist uh, thing, right, where we're all kind of equalized in some way, um, mm -hmm. then then you would need to start to really be super clear about those um, those aspects of it. And it couldn't be rhetorical, right? You'd have to really figure that out. And I think you could even use, you know, your one lens, what you call the physics image, <laughs> the the lens image, which I which I actually really did. What it's what what that starts to show you is the focal length is super important on those lenses. And I, I tend to expect that the lenses that you're gonna be buying don't have a focal length of like eight feet. You know, they probably have a focal length of like three inches or something, like that, you know? And so like, um, uh, you know, like that kind of stuff, but you could draw that, which to me, I've been fascinated about drawing light for a long time, like as like vectorized light. And I think you could really get into that and start to, at least in some ways, start to start to calibrate it through a set of drawings and, and, and other kinds of simulations as well that I think would be really fascinating. Because um, I want to see uh, like the promise of the, the, techno, the techno, the high tech, low tech and mid tech kind of approach and how that sort of like starts to get resolved at a level of detail and a level of refinement. Because I think there are also some potentials for, to, to sort of introduce orientation to introduce also to introduce narrative in this in a different way to introduce um unreal into the real and like all there's all sorts of like heady stuff that you could start to do um with the project like this um you know quotes and 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 you know little little um attacks on the existing space and the banality of that room as it's going to be and like all of those things um i think you could really get into mm -hmm. I think it'd be interesting to see that drawn plan. I'm looking at the plan now, the slide with the plan and the one tree. Yes, that one. Um, <laughs> because what Clay is talking about, I think it would be super interesting to draw, for example, like um, a, uh, to introduce, you know, this is, uh, this is the plan that, you know, that you got from the interior designer and then there's the one tree, but to introduce all of the other components that, that would be uh, associated with this feedback loop into this, including the lights, you know, and all and and all these things, and have arrows pointing. And where's this thermal camera going to be sitting? If it's going to be looking at this, it's got to be sitting out near the tree somewhere, or is it? You know, so where is this thing? Um, I think that would it, it would be, and it doesn't have to be like technically solved, but just something like that is diagramming out the forces and the vectors of all this could be a start. Are there any other factors that draw uh, creatures to the tree besides the visual? I know flower and 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 you know pollinators have a do have a visual um, uh, evolutionary like entwinement, but like other things. Uh, I know um, scent, yeah, scent mm -hmm. especially, and these these magnolias definitely have a scent. Yeah. Um, as well as their their moths are specifically attracted to the pale colored flowers, so light pinks and whites. Um, so yeah. And also, Maybe, I think you could play up on that a bit more. You know, if it's about re revealing, you know, the intangible or the unseen or the atmospheric or whatever it happens to be, I think you could you could start to do little. What would be an ascent amplifier? You know, what would be you know all those kind of possibilities that I think would be really you know fun and interesting and 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 requires some technical uh, capacity that y'all may not have right now but i think the other thing that this points to for me is like you need to have you need to like have a technical i mean there's a technical solution to these either it's the you know you're, you say it might need glue maybe <laughs> you know like these kind of and i realize it's a fast project but there's all sorts of technical questions either the assembly the glue the the, the infrared the setup the projector all of that kind of stuff that you would have to um, eventually figure out. Not right now, you're proposing stuff, but I think that would be the next step, you know. I'd maybe just add one more comment, which uh, kind of goes back to my first question, I guess, which I don't think you guys really answered, actually, but um, which has to do with the larger cycle. So I think, you know, the comments about drawing more of these interactive elements is, is like totally right on in my opinion and i would extend that out further to think about not just you know 24 hours as a as you kind of already did to some extent but over you know the course of a month or a year because presumably the moths also have their own cycle there are times when they're like 
much more dense and lively. Other times when they're not around as much, but birds are around or bees are, you know, as we said, other pollinators. So I, I feel like the tree as a, as a focal point is a good like intuition and place to start, but then the tree also exists in relationship to all these other things, which it's fine to maybe focus on the moth, but, but at the same time, why not look to, or at least consider how, even what you've just done straight away without changing anything, how it would and could or would engage just by its mere presence with these other, these other aspects of, of life really that are happening kind of all around uh, the place. And sure, other, other sensorial things like scent or noise and all that kind of stuff would make sense as well. But I think seeing the tree as more than just this like one, one dimensional thing that has to do with flower and moth, but also seeing it as like an ecosystem in and of itself and how your apparatus will engage with that stuff, whether you want to or not. So you might as well actually kind of look at it and think about it. Yeah. There's something about the, you know, that brings up Brian, like the, there's something in, super interesting, especially if you're gonna be capturing data as this goes along, there's something about long-term sustained observation, you know, that could be actually quite interesting, you know, to see um, the, the subtle changes that add up over time, you know, the difference between climate and weather kind of stuff, you know, and uh, how you could really start to understand through this simple little, seemingly simple tree that sits in the courtyard in, in Austin, Texas, facing this certain direction, like how that one, how one thing could start to be a harbinger maybe or a, a bellwether for other kinds of bigger things that are going on. So, you know, long-term sustained observation is the you know, key tenant of scientific uh, discovery. Yeah, I'm really curious also about, I don't know, the more I, the more I think about it, I'm just wondering, it would be, would be really interesting to just to try a test to get even just any thermal camera and see if it can, like, at, when can it um, when can it detect swarms of insects and when can it not? Um, so just only because it's like I, I'm imagining that it's probably really hot in Texas most of the time, and um, you know, is, is does it do you ever reach a point where you know that you have insects somewhere, but it's just everything is just hot and you just say nothing, everything is the same color? <laughs> or probably it, the tree a lot hotter than the insects. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, the cool the coolest spot. <laughs> right. It's like the whole building is like like burning in the tree. It's probably the coolest thing there. You know? um, here it's snowing today, actually, in Buffalo. <laughs> yeah, I've heard that. That's crazy. <laughs> Anyway, it'd be interesting to just know what, what the threshold of this in terms of seasonality, you know, when, totally. when would that was work and not. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we, yeah, mostly start out with like looking at springtime, but yeah, that'd be interesting to expand the. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the beauty of a pro, I mean, a project like this is more than just like a window project, you know, like what it opened, I mean, the window and the, the, the it's, a, it's a, just a prompt, right? And what you start to see is that it opened, Every, everything that you suppose you figure out, then it opens up something else. It does, you actually don't end up in a narrowing kind of like, uh, kind of methodology or, or track. You end up in something that like opens up totally like wide ranging sets of issues um, that go from the social to the environmental to the uh, etymological to all, you know, all of this stuff that's really, to me, fascinating. And that's, that's the, to me a sign of a good project is that it opens up stuff, not closes it down. It doesn't make you have a singular kind of like proposal. It actually creates a bunch of proposals that you can build on. And I think that's a sign of something that has the, at least the potential for success. Great. So do you have a closing comments for this project? Or we, we can move on? Uh, I would maybe just throw one uh, more a suggestion than a critique, but I, I would say Obviously you're limited with the current situation um, in terms of what you can do, right? So it's obviously all digital at this point, but the early, like I guess, prototype or material experimentations, I think, and this is, I guess, general for all, all of that research were super interesting and provide like a whole nother way of, of engaging with this kind of a project. And I think you've proposed one, a, a strategy that seems reasonable it's of course a whole other thing to test it out. So 
I guess what I'm trying to say is, and I know many of you are graduating, so maybe, maybe it's not possible or feasible, but I would encourage you at some point to like, I don't know, take on a piece of it and, and experiment with the strategy in the, the tangible, because I do think there's a lot of potential there with the things that you're pulling in, the uh, magnification and I forget what was the other thing you you said the loose site I guess where it has the potential to like glow I think there's a lot of just material potential in this that could again relate to all the things that we've been talking about but it would really require sort of physically testing it and mocking it up in the way that you've been working earlier so whenever in the future you might have that opportunity I would encourage you to you know take a piece of it and and kind of maybe make some prototypes because I think it would be super fascinating to explore it in that way as well as the way that you've you've kind of shown today. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I mean, so much of the beauty of this would really rely on um, the kind of creating, trying to create some kind of seamless connection. Um, and you guys mentioned glue or something. I mean, which is possible, but um, definitely possible. But you know, is I don't know. I think trying to figure out what that is, like, do you, is this? Yeah, I think that's something that would be that would be a challenge. And you know, because you have already been working with acrylic a lot, that uh, glue is the, the, you know, the one thing you want to avoid. <laughs> but uh, yeah. But your system, your system as you propose might not require it actually, you know, that, be, yeah. that, that kind of yeah. slotting, if you get the dimensions exactly right and, 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 oh, you know, as you build more of it and you get more interlocking pieces, you might really not even need any glue. So exactly. that's again, where yeah. testing it, you'd have to, but. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we ideally we didn't want to have to use glue, but yeah, of course, just hard with not being able to actually get, cut these pieces and test just them to see if they would hold at that. Yeah, well, it hold over time. That's the other one, yeah. you know, time in terms of that connection because they are going to move um, with, uh, you know, heating and cooling and sun, you know, in very subtle ways that is kind of hard to figure out yeah you, you do have to really materially test that stuff i would one other little point maybe but relative to the to the point of material testing which i think is absolutely you know i think it's embedded in what you were starting to do in an area in a great way um but you know what's interesting to me about the situation that we've been put into is it it starts you know put us into contact with the with the tools and the, and the techniques and the technology in a slightly different way like, I think, you know, the majority of the time we're using a lot of this stuff to just simply represent, I think you can start to think, you know, look at it in a, in a, in a, in a few, through, through a few other lenses and one being sort of simulation, because you can do pretty high test simulations of light and, and simulations of heat and, and simulations of airflow and things that might impact your project. And I think if you you know, looked uh, looked at, at rendering through a different lens and looked at the tool through a slightly different lens, uh, it would open up the, the ability to at least test in a, in a little bit different way. And then you put a suite together of tests, material tests and, and, and sort of models, uh, digital models that have a different kind of purpose. And so, you know, I think again, with all of it, it, it takes a, a, a suite of things, not just one to, to make it happen. Great. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank okay. You. Thank you. Yeah. The next uh, team uh, has a very different approach. I think the the in this third half we're gonna see like three uh, very different ways of approaching the subject. Um, so, are you seeing my screen right now? Mm -hmm. Okay. Can you? So, uh, Okay. Uh, yeah. You hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay. Hi, I'm Michelle. Natalie and Paula and I work on the insect canopy. So, I'm stepping in. so this studio aims to bring public attention to the importance of insects, particularly local pollinators, in the face of our impending biodiversity crisis. Recent studies predict that 40% of insect species are in danger of extinction in the coming decades due to the use of pesticides, climate change, and extensive urbanization. In celebration of the under-acknowledged world of insects, we are asked to design an in intervention in the windows of the studio, placed at the south wing, as you see in the Goldsmith. In addition to just the visual intervention, we wanted to do kind of intervene 
more physically and create an experiential space where humans and insects can coexist together. So our site is Goldsmith on the UT campus. As you know, Goldsmith is a building serving as the primary home of our, of our School of Architecture built in 1932. It, has a, it is a historical building. We love the Goldsmith building, not just because of the history of it and its beautiful exterior. Goldsmith has a courtyard, a iconic and built up space for architectural students and the UT students alike. It is constantly used for gatherings, celebrations, studying, or just simply as a rejuvenating moments of fresh air. So often you can find the professors teaching informally and using it as an outdoor classroom. Actually, our studio also had a class at the beginning of this semester talking about the insect vision in this courtyard. So not only is there a lot of human interaction, there is an abundance of plants and insects too. So you can see the magnolia trees here. So every spring magnolia blooms beautifully and lots of people even who are not in School of Architecture visit and spend time here. So while the studio assignment was to intervene in the window associated with the studio connected to loggia, we sought to expand this application to the loggia located on the second floor in the goldsmith. We believe the loggia has the same potential as the courtyard has, and we wanted to expand those opportunities to this space. The studio that we were asked to design an intervention is placed here. We chose to deploy our main intervention in the loggia of the Goldsmith because we believe it is an underutilized space of our school, in particular due to the direct sunlight. It received the majority of the day. This is uncomfortable for humans, however ideal for plants and insects. So this image is made based on afternoon 1 p.m. So we could find that the loggia is directly exposed to the sun from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Uh, just one second, Michelle, can you go back mm -hmm. for the outside yeah. critics that don't know the, the building to, if you, yeah. So the classroom that they're intervening in has direct access to the loggia. Uh, mm -hmm. So in the L shape that you were seeing earlier, uh, there's this, this, this door and those two windows are part of the classroom. Yeah, this is the studio and there's, this is the door to the loggia through the studio. So we are proposing the installation of insect canopy in the loggia. The goal of insect canopy is to provide an interaction between humans and insects. Often these encounters are considered undesirable or uncomfortable. However, we believe it is a necessary step in changing the way we view this past. We hope to change the tolerance we have toward these insects and view them as the integral part of our world that they are. As also, our goal is to use plants to attract pollinators and plant people. We want to use foliage as a shading strategy and provide additional shading outdoors for students. We envision insect canopy to be an extension of the classroom here especially during this, uh, this unprecedented time with protocol changing in the fall, our aim is to adapt to these changes and provide an usable outdoor space beyond the classroom. So this is same is made based on the afternoon time 1 p.m. when it was usually directly exposed to the sunlight. So we believe this living ecosystem provide a perfect outdoor environment, not only for insects, but also for humans. This image is a view from the courtyard looking at the loggia. So this is the classroom that we started to intervene. Insect canopy started from this classroom and has extended to the loggia while embracing the courtyard. So Nala is going to explain the design processes in detail further. So we imagine the structure consisting of a concrete base to provide structural support for the rest of the intervention. The base ranges from four inches thick to 12 inches thick, a shell, and ranges from six inches tall to 48 inches tall. 
The base will double as planters and as outdoor seating. The base has an organic form that creates a variety of seating types. So as you can see, there are individual pockets as well as longer benches that can um, accommodate a variety of functions. So whether a professor wants to hold class outside or if a student wants to study individually or simply relax, there's a spot for everyone. Next, chrome finished steel poles will be inserted in precasted holes in the concrete base. And these poles will provide moments for the fishing line trellis to attach to, and they will also hold suspended seating. So we wanted to use chrome finished steel, steel because we anticipate the poles will start to reflect the surrounding environment and hopefully start to become invisible. Um, allowing the vines or plants to really be the main focal point of the space. Uh, soil will add additional weight to the structure. So based on the square footage of the loggia, it is supposed to be able to support about 36,000 pounds. Um, with the concrete base, the steel poles, and the soil, we expect our intervention to weigh approximately 30,000 pounds. Um, we're aware that the loggia has suffered water damage in the past, so it would definitely need some structural reinforcement to accommodate this intervention. However, because Insect Canopy is providing a completely additional outdoor classroom, we definitely believe this would be a worthwhile investment. Additional planters will be placed on all sides surrounding the loggia, and they will act as counterweights for the trellis. These are very important components of the structure and they would need to be fairly heavy in order to keep the trellis in tension. Eye hook screws is how we would attach the fishing line trellis to each component and they'd be spaced about an inch apart on center. So a series of fishing line will attach to the planters and poles in twisting fashions to form a trellis for the plants to grow on in various directions. We wanted to use fishing line for a few reasons. Uh, first, it's very lightweight material that can support a great amount of weight. For example, we would probably use 30 pound braided fishing line. Uh, furthermore, clear fishing line essentially becomes transparent in the environment. So similar to the chrome finished steel, we would want the vines to have support all the while being uh, still the main focal point of the space. So as you can see in this section, the trellis has attachments at all different moments and at all different heights. And this is an attempt to have the plants grow all around and in all different directions, creating a natural looking canopy. So one thing that was really important to us was to have the structure be fully self-supported and autonomous. Uh, this decision was made due to the historical building that Goldsmith is. We did not want to destroy or interrupt the facade or structural integrity of the building in any way. So for this reason, we made it a completely removable structure that simply sits atop the loggia. Lastly, woven seats will be suspended from the chrome poles. Uh, we chose a woven thread, threaded pattern for the seats as we wanted it to match the language of the trellis. So this image here shows what we anticipate insect canopy to look like after a few years of growth. We picture all the plants starting to grow together to form a fully encompassing cohesive green environment. We have chosen specific plant species for this space based on blooming seasons, growth patterns, and the pollinators that these plants attract. For example, all these plants have longer blooming periods, and this is ideal as it would allow insect canopy to be in bloom for as much of the year as possible. Furthermore, these plant species have different growth tendencies. So for example, the lantana bush is often used in hanging planters due to its tendency tendency to grow out and flow downward out of its pot. So for this reason, we would use lantana, for example, in the planters above the loggia to encourage the flow of its growth 
out and down toward the center of the canopy. Oh, uh, these are some more plants selected for similar reasons um, as stated earlier. However, these plants are more vine-like, so these ones in particular, in particular would be planted on the planters outside the balusters so that they could climb the trellis. Uh, all the plant species listed do well in Texas and they attract the local pollinators. So this was really important. It was a really important piece of our design as we were trying to bring awareness to the heroes in our own backyard. So an additional optical component of our design is a pattern film applied to the northern facing windows looking out towards insect canopy. And um, Paula will now tell you more about this. Thank you. So with the optic component, we wanted to enhance the view out towards the loggia to draw further intrigue into an insect experience. The windows will help blur the line between the interior and exterior and transition our surroundings to the insect's environment. This perspective specifically begins to show the effects we wish to accomplish through the film. This is the elevation looking from the interior out towards the loggia showing how and where we wanted to apply the film design. So the window design is based on previous research we collected throughout the semester. The pattern film design is more dense in the moments where the vegetation in view is abundant and less dense where it's sparse. This mimics, as it's starting to explain on image C, pollinators attraction to high frequency patterns at closer proximity to vegetation. Also, we chose to create the pattern through various size dots to represent in an abstracted form each picture element these received from their omatidia. And to explain a little further on omatidia, they're the optical units that make up a compound eye. On image B, you can see an example of an insect's compound eye where on its surface, it looks like a hexagonal pattern, but in cross section of the eye, you see that each one is extruded all the way into the eye. And each one of these is one omatidium, and they contain a cluster of photoreceptor cells surrounded by support and pigment cells. So essentially each omatidium provides the insect's brain with one picture element. And how you can begin to see an image A1 and A2, the insect's brain forms an image from these independent picture elements. So the concept and the level of acuity um, from insects is what we also abstracted into the design of the window. And in terms of materials, we chose a dichroic film as a representation of the wide um, array of colors these pollinators are capable of seeing. Um, in image D, you can see the spectrum where their spectrum is more inclined towards blue and purple hues. And this is just an example of previous work iterated showing our interest with the visual cues bees use to recognize and separate flower species to see which one is most profitable for them. So in terms of our window design, you can see where the points where we began to draw the, um, create the bigger circles and the overlapping of the film in points where we anticipate to see the most vegetation, regardless of which angle you're viewing it from. In the axon, you can see how the dichroic film will be directly applied to the interior of the glass in a vinyl application fashion, and it won't interfere with the pre-existing um, design of the window, nor the operable functions of it as well. And towards the right is a depiction that helps you imagine how the pattern will interact with the vegetation on the other side. This is a perspective looking towards the intervene studio, ideally showcasing the coexistence of the people and the vegetation and the insects. This space will allow students to engage with the local pollinators of Austin and bring awareness to the importance of these insects in our own lives by immersing ourselves in theirs. Insects play a key role in the environment as pollinators, seed dispersers, and decomposers. And these insects' homes are dwindling in the city, so we wanted to provide them another space to inhabit on the UT campus. Insect canopy will celebrate these insects and bring awareness to their significance. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you for that presentation. Um, just to clarify, do, is that um, terrace used a lot or is it just too hot there all the time and no one uses it? So actually used. there's, yeah, <laughs> there, now there's no incentive. Nobody uses it. We never really see anybody there. Um, so with our proposal, it kind of creates that incentive um, and eliminates like the sun issue. Mm. Yeah, it's an interesting proposal. I think, um, like, I mean, I think one, I wish that we could figure out how to make this kind of happen in a way, but like, uh, I think there's some issues that I think you could play off of that, because to me, I would like to understand the system of it all again, like what are all the parts and pieces, how do they work together? And then where's the building in that? Because I think you could develop the system before the fact of the building and then it's, tailor it to the building and then it can become something that's that has a little bit more legs in terms of repeatability. Um, I think you could, you know, like, I don't think one, as a historic building, touching historic buildings is always a problem. And so like, if you could take take it away from how, like touching the balustrades and touching the, the, um, the, the, the roof of this of the adjacent uh, buildings, I think it could become more freestanding and self contained in that space. Uh, that would solve some some historic problems and allow it to be um, systematized in a slightly different way. Um, I think you could get all the same effects. You could also start to play around with the potential for the, you know, the, I like the window treatments actually, but I think the, when that stuff could start to even become free floating in some ways and wouldn't have to be just privileged to the window. Um, and so, you know, I would challenge you to think about it in that way because, you um, even even in this sort of very light way that you're touching the buildings, like it's always a problem, um, especially on campus buildings, but any historic building is always gonna be an issue to attach to. Um, so if you could make it more freestanding, even to have a ground that sits above the existing um, uh, uh, surface out there would be another, you know, to flatten it one, because it's all sloping, um, but that would allow you to sort of free float this inside of that space um, which could be pretty interesting, actually. But I, I like the intent of this project and the, the you know, I, who doesn't like the hanging gardens of Babylon kind of like outside your window? Um, but I don't know if it would look like that, but I don't care. I, I, I like aspirational <laughs> in this case. Yeah, I think it's a, it's actually a really beautiful idea. And I like the I, I like the drawings. I'm, I'm also scrolling through your PDF right now, sort of looking at all the drawings. Um, I like this this idea of this kind of hanging canopy idea. I guess I'm sort of thinking about though, um, you know, yes, if, if this were something that were actually going to be built here, I think that um, it feels like it would be, it would be somehow more interesting if it were built in this location to perhaps not use concrete and all this soil. And I know you want to have plants there, of course, but to try to find some system so that you're planters are not so heavy because I, I can't imagine that you would actually be able to build this without actually having to do heavy structural reinforcements. Um, I'm looking at your section right now. I don't know which slide number this is, but um, it's like a section drawing where you see this kind of mass um, sitting on the slab. Yeah, that one. And um, I, yeah, I think you would probably need some, some heavy reinforcement. It feels like it would but the whole system is like hanging, which is interesting. So it feels like it could be something like where you build maybe pieces and components that, that can be taken apart. Maybe they're like planters that get brought in and kind of aggregated or something like that. But with that said though, I think I like the overall, I like the, the way that you're developing the form. If you go to the next slide, the axon drawing of it, I like the, the, the way that the concrete is creating these little like mini enclaves of like seating and the, the, the kind of shapes that, of that it's creating spatial conditions that it's creating. Um, like, and part of me is just kind of thinking, oh, this would be so great to just make on the ground. You know, this looks like a ground, it wants to be on the ground somewhere rather than on that, on that terrace. But at the same time, I like the idea of like, you know, giving shade to this terrace that really should be used. I mean, that looks like an amazing space. It's a few bad people don't use it then. Well, I wondered, you know, I, I watched your video early on of the process that you guys were going through for the furniture and you know the hempcrete i'd never heard of it before but it seemed pretty interesting i don't know it's obviously less durable i would imagine than concrete but i wonder if that wouldn't be a solution or i mean i guess in its current state your proposal somehow needs the weight and solidity of the concrete 
to actually, uh, as you said, kind of hold itself up, hold the tension. But maybe given the previous suggestions, maybe if you rethought that a little bit, you could actually propose something similar, but using the material you've already spent a lot of time working with. And it seemed quite successful, even if slightly unfinished because of the um, circumstance. So that, that would be one thing I think it, you could almost kind of keep what you have and just switch out the material. Now, maybe, maybe it needs to get a little thicker in some places or a little deeper or whatever that it might change, but more or less the, the starting point could be kind of more or less what, what you have. The other question I really wanted to pose because I agree with the comments. I mean, I think it's a, it's certainly an ambitious proposal relative to the prompt, which I think is always uh, good, but also opens you opens yourself up for a lot of other criticism, perhaps. But um, my my one question, if you ever considered it, has to do with water, because of course you know the images. I keep turning because I'm looking at the images on my other screen here too. Uh, th this amount of vegetation requires also quite a lot of water, and you mentioned the fact that there's some drainage issues already on the roof leaking. So I just wonder if there is an opportunity there for some other, I don't know if you need a whole nother system, but some way in which the design engages with the collection and the kind of like holding of water that then obviously irrigates the, the plants. That seems like a, a, a simple or maybe obvious thing to consider, but it also might really solve some of your problems, mm -hmm. I guess, or some of the problems with the existing, mm -hmm. the existing roof. And certainly it's something that will need to be addressed regardless if this was to actually be built, you know, you, you're probably not going to want somebody out there every day like watering this stuff. If you had the system in place to actually do it, not maybe entirely on its own, but a lot of it on its own, then that would be all the more desirable for the from the school standpoint, let's say. Yeah, Sorry. we agree that, yeah, that's exactly what we discussed before. The first one is the hypocrite. Actually, we was thinking about using hypocrite for the planter that going to give us more cohesive for our projects but we're concerned about, you know, that's not heavier enough comparing the concrete. But yeah, definitely that is one of opportunity to develop water. And also you we think take... about- mm -hmm. No, sorry. No, I you go, go ahead. Take my, my excitement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and also we thought about kind of developing self, you know, irrig irrigation system also, but yeah, but because of the kind of time issues that we cannot develop that far. But yeah, that's, we 100% agree that. Yeah. What's that interesting is it's the, it's the tyranny of a concept, I think, because like actually, if you were, because I think you had it in your mind that it had to be heavy and heavy had to be one, there's one way to make heavy and that's with concrete planter. I think you can start to think about different ways to hold things down. I mean, that's what you're doing, right? You want to hold it down. And so there's a way that there's, a way, and I don't know if it would work, but you, you start to think about extensive kinds of load distribution rather than localized load distribution to hold it down. And so like, mm -hmm. if you, especially if, you're, if you talk about like what Ryan was suggesting, which is developing a whole system, you know, rather than that has water and uh, even electric, electrical requirements, all these things, it, structural requirements all built into it that are outside of the building then you would start to have to build a floor and the floor is spread and all of a sudden you have lots of ways to distribute that load um, in a actually lighter or, mm -hmm. or the localized loads could be less, um, you know, which could be really interesting. It would give you a, a place for water to go underneath. You could have all these distribution channels and things kind of embedded in that. Um, and then it could all be, you know, it could all be steel or it could be steel and aluminum or aluminum or something, you know, lightweight kind of metal in general um, that would allow you to kind of get there. I like the hempcrete too. I think the hempcrete's really beautiful. I don't know about it, but I think, you know, you can start to recalibrate, you know, like, oh, it has to be heavy. It has to be concrete, put you in one place instead of like, oh, we have to hold it down. How can we do that, right? Yeah. Which is, yeah. which is That's a great suggestion, sure. right? this extended, yeah, this uh, great extended foundation of the project that the foundation mm -hmm. might be the whole floor no and then you mm -hmm. can uh, put local weight uh, weights no more uh, yeah so True. that but, but the handcrete is really doesn't work structurally well that's the problem with the handcrete it doesn't work as it, it works great as an insulation but it's usually as a, 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 a as application in, in buildings uh, mostly um, as a cladding or uh, but with a lot of uh, i mean Maybe with a lot of uh, reinforcement, uh, it could work. 
maybe. But were you guys yeah. not using it as seating? Or it yeah. was just because it was so temporary, it would kind of be okay, but. Temporary, and it, ha it did have reinforcement. I, I guess it could, I mean, there's different opinions. That's what we thought at first it could, then uh, we talked to one of uh, this hemp uh, texture uh, expert that they've been, and he really didn't recommend, which we learned later in the design process that uh, he was uh, really skeptical of the structural uh, performance of a uh, hemp grid. Right. Um, but it is used, uh, yeah, and, and he said it's ideally is, is, is best used for as an insulator than as a structural, you know, yeah. yeah. How heavy is it relative to <clears throat> regular concrete, concrete? Is it super, is it much lighter or? Yeah, it's very light. And it oh, okay. the thing is also there's different ratios. And I think uh, we used the ratio that had the less arid to it. It had a, so it was mostly like compacted grass. The more, maybe with more uh, uh, arid or uh, no, uh, bounding uh, the mix, it gets, it does get a lot heavier also, but then, uh, but also stronger in that the, the ones that we use that we build the seats out of, um, that had very little arid on it, uh, with uh, really, really little. It was mostly just the compact grass. Mm -hmm. one, one other thought I had relative to the structure. So obviously the base is one condition, but the other condition are these planters that are resting on top and along the perimeter, which are obviously necessary for, for, for planting, for the vines to grow but potentially could have some issues related to, again, touching the building and all that. So I, I do wonder if you could, or maybe even have considered that the other, like the vertical elements and the, the webbing or the fishing line, like if you actually saw it as a, as a tensegrity structure, then you still have to deal with the base because you have to hold the thing up somehow, but it would actually, through the use of the, the kind of tension members produce a kind of stable structure. So it's it's not that the tension is only for carrying the vines and producing covering, but it would actually be performing structurally somehow. Now that's of course not so easy to figure out or design, but I, it does seem like you're almost kind of halfway there. And if you really took that on, let's say you had more time of course, or you really took that on and, and I'm sure there's a way to get something that would be more independent, but still achieve very close to what you almost already already have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I totally agree. I think, I mean, I think this is just such a great structure that to experiment with, it would be amazing to try to build the, to try to build this physically, um, you know, just even as a model to test the kind of mm -hmm. forces. Um, I think, you know, cause I think if it were going to actually be up on the terrace, I, I would probably try to, um, imagine some kind of more of a stick system or something that can be taken apart more easily or something, um, you know, in terms of, and not work with these kind of like heavy forms or at least, but I think, you know, as everyone's been saying before, but I think at the same time, I, I just love the, um, what you're all, what you're doing with this. And I, and part of me is just wishing that you could just take this whole thing, take it down to the ground somewhere and just make it a ground project. Um, Cause I like the kind of the difference in the language, like the kind of mass, and then the kind of lightness and the sticks, like I like the kind of three, the three components together. I, and then I guess we're just talking about this, but, um, uh, and I know that you worked on the um, window system, which is also very nice, but I, I guess I'm curious to know, is there, did I miss something? Is, is, was there supposed to be some kind of direct relationship or some, a more kind of um, more, what was the narrative between the window and the, and the terrace again? Yeah, so um, it was more so um, as the transition into the space. So being in the interior studio and being able to, um, we only placed them in the windows um, because of the fact that it's windows, I would hope so, but we're just used as a like more visual experience. So being able to see um, in a simulated or abstracted like insect way um, as you're still in the um, interior studio and then actually going through the door and being able to experience this kind of insect ecosystem. So it's just, we, we used it more so as a transition from interior to the exterior. Oh, okay. Going as like an experience, like seeing as them to being with them. Mm -hmm. <laughs>
Mm -hmm. The only problem I have with that claim is that the window gets in the way of that. Like it to me, it's still because it's so inset inside of each little pane. Like the like, I still see the too much of the window. I want I want the window to go away. I want because at that because I think it's not just, it's not just the vision; it's the scale of vision um, that you you know in, a, in an immersive kind of way. And I, I feel like it's always with the first two window uh, 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 proposals that it's. Um, it's always externalized and not sort of experiential in terms of immersive kind of experience. And so like, I feel like the window is getting in the way of the, of the goal there. And so I don't know what the solution is, but I think that would, that would be something you would need to kind of like develop a bit more. I mean, I think the intention is good, but I think the, the resolution, I mean, even in this image, the, the sort of like, you know, division of the, of the lights of the window is to me gets in the way of the effect that you're trying to, um, uh, generate there. One other kind of note that I think uh, the uh, I kind of got excited there for a second when Joyce was talking, but like I think if you if you decontextualize the roof project and don't even if you didn't even have a ground that it was touching and you had to and you had to create something that was sort of more self-contained, I think you would be able to solve all these problems. You would have to have You'd have to generate an artificial ground that all this stuff sits on and, and is supported by that supports the rest and then you could come back and contextualize it um it's a tool it's kind of a trick that you can use on a lot of different projects sometimes to just figure out what is, what is important um to prioritize and, and figure out what it can do um, and not rely on the context so much and then come back and rub it up against the context to see uh where where you can affect the context in a slightly different way um, to me, it's almost like it could be this sort of like metal bug that's on its back, but then supports all this other stuff. Um, mm -hmm. It couldn't be fishing line either, by the way. It would need to be metal, uh, like braided um, yeah. cable uh, long yeah. term, but that's a, that's a small quibble. But. You know, another funny thing about this, um, or in, it's interesting, at least it's interesting to me about this canopy system is that some of the seating is so, I know that you're, well, you're, the idea is that you're bringing people close to insects so that they can be with them, right? But, but that is also something that sometimes can cause um, some form of conflict. You know, imagine if like you have all these flowers and there's bees swarming around. If you have a seat right next to it, people might not want to sit there. Um, but at the same time, if it's, if there's the flowers that are producing the scent and people want to, you know, sit there, then that's, you know, then in their shade, then there's the kind of trade-off, right? So I wonder if there's a way to kind of um, think about the relationship of seeding relative to plants, thinking about that distance that humans experience with, um, you know, with uh, insects, like what, what that distance, what's a comfortable distance? How do you kind of encroach on it just ever so slightly? Um, but I, I like this proposal, this whole thing. And, and as I was saying before, part of me just thinks you should just take this idea and make a pavilion proposal for it and enter in a competition, you know? <laughs> Thank you. Totally agree. Thank you. <laughs> great guys, um, really good, great work. So yeah, let's, um, last team, no? Let's see the last project. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hey everyone. Um, my name is Lisa. I'm Hannah. And I'm Anna. Um, and this is our proposal. The title of our project is Microlens which describes the elusive world of bees, butterflies, and other insects that humans are generally unaccommodating of. In this project, we work to merge the interior and the exterior, designing a solution that encourages an increased awareness of our surrounding environment. Our goals center around a few key ideas. We wanted to create a space that is relaxing and that encourages an up-close view of the insect micro world. It was also imperative to not just build something aesthetically pleasing, but to also support biodiversity. To accomplish this, we incorporated a habitat for bees and other insects. The installation is intentionally designed to allow students to personalize the replacement of its parts. Overall, these are the goals aimed to bring closer two worlds that have grown apart. The site of our intervention is within Goldsmith Hall. 
the main building of the School of Architecture at UT. The windows of the third floor classroom face north, so we wanted to bring in as much light as possible throughout the day. Within the central courtyard are Chinese magnolia trees, which have become one of the most attractive sites on campus. These trees have a heavy influence on the window design, a process that we will show in a few slides. The specific pair of windows we chose to intervene in are located in the corner of the classroom, behind the blossoms. Here the sun washes the adjacent wall with light, which becomes farther pronounced in our intervention. It's tucked into the side of the room. This location is a more reserved space in comparison to, the, in, in comparison to others. Students can come here to take leisure or sightseeing. So this is a video that we've created that shows the abstraction of the Chinese magnolias through, the, through Grasshopper's image sampler to create the final pattern. We took inspiration from these trees to create a similar design that not only echoes the courtyard's vegetation, but also pays respect to the existing facade of Goldsmith. So that's the final pattern that we're going to go forward with um, through our design. Here is a render of our overall exterior of our intervention. Um, this generated pattern from the Chinese magnolia is made up of two different types of tubes, tubes that have the genus and tubes that allow a greater visual effect. The diagram of our proposal, the blue are the hollow iridescent acrylic tubes that have wooden inserts where the bees can nest, and the pink dots are solid iridescent acrylic tubes that can create a calming visual effect using sunlight from outside the studio. And then these are the types of bee species that could live in our wooden tube habitats. 90% of bees native to Texas are actually solitary species. So that unlike social bees, solitary bees establish and provision nests on their own with no assistance from other individuals, so they don't produce hives. And I wanted to make sure that everyone knew that solitary bees um, can be approached without fear of defensive attack. Solitary bees are not defending a hive. Man is next to areas of human activity and people don't need to be afraid of being stung. And this will make the maintenance of our proposal Many solitary bees are ground nesters, but the remaining solitary bees nest in existing cavities of dead wood or chew from cavities into woody material. Proposed wooden tubes for the bee cavity nesters. Um, during the spring and summer months, female solitary bees will provision nests with food, lay eggs, and then seal the nest upon completion. So you can see how that looks in the picture in the upper left, how they close off the tubes. Um, because the tubes are being used as nests, uh, we decided that we wanted to use the branches of our design as the places we would like to house our bug habitats. Um, so that the light, uh, the shadows produced by those branches will be a more solid shadow. And then after the nest is completed, fem females move on to the next nesting opportunity. They can create multiple nests in the same area throughout the spring and summer. In the following spring or summer, the eggs will hatch and the process will begin again. Native bees have two basic needs, food in the form of nectar and pollen from flowers and a suitable place to nest and lay eggs. So we provided a space for our solitary bees to nest and we also wanted to provide proposed plant species to pull in pollinators. So semi-evergreen vines attract hummingbirds, the Mexican flame vine and milkweed attract monarchs, and the echinacea or coneflower attracts a lot of our solitary bees. As you can see these plants growing up the side of the building towards our window proposal. And then here's just a close-up render of our tube proposal. As mentioned previously, the materials we chose to use include a wooden interior cavity paired with solid and hollow iridescent tubes, all of which slide into the clear sleeves attached to the 3D printed window glasses. What is a popular choice in insect hotels because they provide warmth um, and security for bees throughout the year, and we use iridescence because of its ability to reflect and refract light. 
Consistent and dichroic display the optical phenomenon where a surface appears as different colors, depending on the angle from which it is viewed. The material is functioning like a prism in bending light waves, but it also may increase the installation's attraction of bees and other insects. The column displays a few alternate suggestions of different types of wood species and tube materiality. These can be made by students at the university, including 3D printed clear acrylic and CNC wood. Study inspirations came from previous material studies with our bug filters made earlier this semester. Using a mirror and Hannah's bug filter, I experimented with magnifying acrylic. There's material on both Lisa and I's filter, and Lisa also experimented with small mirrored pieces that are able to rotate within the filter. All these early material studies made by us exemplify how students can explore with different materials to create their own unique tube inserts. So this elevation, these next elevations will show how the tubes change from night to day, going from an iridescent color during the day to a warm glow at night due to the fact that they are solar powered. It will also help attract other bugs to the windows at night. Here's a night render showing how it's going. So these drawings just show our window assembly. So beginning with the drawing on the right, we have an axon showing how each individual window pane can be removed. These panes will be made of 3D printed clear acrylic, which again can be made at the university. The weight of each individual pane is important so that our design can be easily adapted by students over time and for the habitat maintenance of our solitary bees. The drawing on the top left shows each piece of our assembly. The structural frame holds our removable panes. There's a few between the structural frame and the removable pane that acts as an insulator. A wooden frame will hold our 3D printed acrylic window glasses and each pane is screwed into the frame. And then our final drawing on this sheet shows a closer detail of our proposed tubes. Our 3D printed window glasses and tubes will be made as one piece. So the tubes will be printed as hollow sleeves where a material can be placed. The sleeves will be open towards the courtyard to allow bee nesting, but they'll be capped from the inside of the studio so insects can't enter into the classroom, just exist within the tube. And the removability of the caps will also be easy um, for bee maintenance and design adaptability. And we just emphasize that our project can be adapted by students in the future, so the three printed hollow sleeves can be filled with whatever material. And then this is a window section detail that again shows the order of our structure. While the hollow tubes are strategically organized in their undulation, the solid ones which portray the blossoms jut out a bit further than the habitats. The purpose of this is to not only catch more sunlight, but to also shield and protect the habitats that are nested further in. These hollow tubes as shown in our previous diagram represents the tree branches. Next, we have a construction drawing of our um, entire installation um, with the seat. The seat is modeled and dimensioned accordingly to hug the curve of the human body so that it provides a comfortable place for relaxation in the studio while also providing views of the outdoors. The seat is molded out of concrete and the same pattern from the window is carved into its surface. And here we have an exploded axon of our entire project. So you can see um, how we got our design from the Chinese magnolia that's behind the window and then the piece with our seat and then just um, back to front, we have again, the structural metal frame, the rubber insulator, the removable 3D printed window frames, our fasteners, and then our proposed iridescent tubes with the wooden bee nesting cavities. So these next few images give an overall view of our proposal, showing the material effects, the connection with the indoors and outdoors, and the surrounding environment. And now we're going to play an animation, which is kind of a um, visual representation of how we envision insects and people moving through the space and how they will interact with intervention. And that includes our 
proposal. Thank you. Do I stop sharing? No. no. Why, why is it just two windows? Is that, was that a requirement? The scale or the scope of the project? Uh, no, it wasn't a requirement. Um, we just wanted to intervene like in a place that is more secluded, that is more reserved so that like if students want to take a break and they can go to the corner, have their own time. Um, also the, the intervention makes the windows not operable. Um, so we we're thinking if that's not possible with what we're working with, then the rest of the windows and the rest of the classrooms. I think, I think personally, I would like to see it bigger. I think, cause I, I actually, I was dubious about the pattern at first. And I think, uh, I, I'm, I'm more bought into it in its final sort of resolution in some ways, but I just think it's, it's so, it's not expensive enough. Uh, to sort of pay off yet. I think, feel like it would need to be a lot bigger for that feel to make sense. Uh, I mean, that's a, that's a small, that's a smaller, or I mean, it's a bigger question, but it's a different question maybe, but I wish it was the whole wall, you know? <laughs> mm -hmm. Including the wall, not just the window. <laughs> yeah, no, this is a beautiful, beautiful project. I love the uh, drawings and the video. And um, I, I guess I'm, I'm also sort of thinking like, how can this happen? Um, it would be amazing to, to get this, to, to have this happen. And not only is it beautiful, but it's also this kind of insect habitat. And you've got, you're thinking about the, um, you know, the idea of maintenance and removing things and so on. So I think that's all really wonderful. That's really great. Um, a, I think a big part of the effect of this though, depends on um, what, well, really how this, like how it actually looks. And so I, I was, I'm scrolling through your PDF again, um, just looking at the part where you're, <clears throat> the slide, actually I'm scrolling back. I don't, I can't seem to find it. I'm looking for the slide that has, where you're talking about the um, the mirroring effect and layers and stuff like that. I guess I'm just, I'm curious to know how, how you're, um, like, yeah, how are you producing this effect? And it, would it really, would you really be able to kind of get this kind of, this kind of effect in this, in the circumstance? I mean, that's beautiful, that, that image that you just passed by. Yeah. Um, would this, yeah, and then go to the next one that you were about to talk from. Is it this one or? Yeah, this one, like how does, like would you be able to, and then the other thing is like the, these, these, this is both inside and outside, right? So some of these sticks are sticking inside. So then you have to, you have to deal ultimately with something about, um, about the kind of see the enclosure of the building. Mm -hmm. um, is that ever, would that be a problem or is that not so much a problem in Texas? If, if this, if you built this here, I think it would be a problem. It would be a problem? Yeah, thermal break would be necessary for sure, yeah. Because I imagine that something like this would be okay in um, a climate like say California, where you know the, the outside temperature and the inside temperature could more or less be the same and your wall could just be, or Spain or something, um, some parts of Spain, but, I'm, but in terms of Texas, I don't think this would work in Buffalo. I, I guess I'm just wondering, yeah, what, what would be the limit of, of this? Um, um, we, we wouldn't have the tubes be open between the outside and the inside. They would all be capped from the inside. But like, I guess I'm wondering, um, you don't have, oh, you, I can't do the annotate thing on this, can I? Okay, well, um, I was just wondering, maybe it's actually a two pane system. Maybe you have the, the tube sticking into the into the glass pane and there and you actually have two layers of glass. So this one is on the outside, but then you have another layer that's actually the kind of the um, you know the actual enclosure of the building that's on the inside yeah. of it. So you still see the effect of this. Um, yeah. Like an ant farm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But have, have you experimented with actually producing this effect? Um, we have in our, oh, sorry. Yeah, we have in our um, individual bug filters that, that we were working on uh, before quarantine. Mm -hmm. Iridescence and then uh, the mirror and then the magnifying glass with, with layered iridescence in, in Anna's as well. 
Um, we haven't been able to produce um, an actual model of this specific project no. just because the, the school mm -hmm. closed. Our idea was kind of that the tubes being so close together that the light would kind of bounce off of them and like hit each other. So they would create this like very cool light effect inside. So the colors would all bounce around because they're so close together. Mm -hmm. That's why you need more of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I agree with that. I, I, um, I really appreciate, like I, I keep looking at the image previous as well, the kind of zoomed in view. I think it's a couple slides before this, just in how mm. interesting, you know, how provocative it is and the, the effect is so just, yeah, kind of beautiful, but also provocative. It's, we're not really sure what we're looking at. It almost feels like liquid and I don't know if you could achieve it or not, but let's say you can. Uh, the part that I really maybe have the most kind of questions about I don't know, it's, um, it's not, I guess it's like the structure. And so I get that it's a historic building. I, I understand that you have like these dimensions of the grid and it matches the mullions of the adjacent windows and all that. But I feel like the project would actually benefit from, kind of, from challenging that a little bit. And maybe it's that, like I keep wanting to, instead of having this very strange relationship between the tube and then the flat, plane where these things get stuck into it. And I understand you're 3D printing it and maybe you can produce it fine. But just from a like, I guess like a tectonic relationship of a material relationship, it's very weird. It's like these things have just been like punctured. And I don't know if that's good or bad. It's just seems strange to me. So I do wonder if there's a version of this where you just like fill the whole thing up. And so maybe you have the pattern and those are a certain type and then you have other tubes that are a little bigger or smaller that fill in in between that are just transparent and they're not, they're maybe not about housing bees. They're just about kind of producing literally the structure. So this thing as an infill could be self-supporting or something like that. And, and then you could, I don't know, like these, this orthogonal grid really for me, like throws the whole thing off because the, um, like if I just sort of like crop the, 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 the image and, and get the effect that I think you really want, it, it, it becomes really, really e even stronger. So, you know, again, it's a historic building, so maybe you can't, that's not feasible, but it will be interesting to sort of play this out. Maybe it's just more expansively as was suggested or rethinking actually the kind of structure of it and how the system you're developing could in a way potentially be be self-supporting and, and maybe it's again also varying the scale a little bit so the infill pieces could be bigger or have like another quality to them or, or quality but also like aesthetic quality but experiential quality but also performative quality in the sense that they actually do something else for you. Mm -hmm. You'd be surprised what, what, what changing the, the, the terminology from permanent to temporary installation would get you you know, like I, I think, you know, once it becomes self-supporting, then it can become pseudo-temporary. Then all of a sudden, the issues of of uh, you know affecting the historic building go away in some ways. It's like um, designers play games like that all the time in buildings, changing the name of a corridor to a hallway and things like this to get around <laughs> certain kind of code constraints. And you know, and like, and so I could think you could be clever about the terminology that you use and how that affects the system and it so that you can get more like me like what I'm greedy because I look at this and I'm like my god I want to see that like a lot of it not just one little tiny little thing I want to see like a big expanse of this cool like visual effect but also what else it's doing you know providing habitat and uh, observation points and all these things for um for creatures and so like, like you know I think being more greedy um, and it would be, would be a good in this case. <laughs> yeah, no, it is really beautiful. Um, on the other hand though, I, I like the rendering that you have of, um, I think it's like a nighttime view where mm -hmm. uh, you see this in the corner mm -hmm. and it's just sort of just that one corner. Yeah, there, mm -hmm. That's nice. um, there's something really, really nice about just the idea of like kind of going to a classroom or into this room and, and that everything sort of seems the same, but suddenly there's this little corner that's kind of glowing in this strange way. There's like a, a, weird, a surreality to the, to the image of, of your project that 
and could be played up a bit more as well. Mm -hmm. um, and also from the exterior, the, it's just so weird, you know, looking at some of the exterior renderings with these kind of tubes poking out of glass. Um, and so, yeah, I'm always kind of thinking like, how, yeah, it's like everything looks sort of camouflaged. Like, like that one's so weird too. It's, you know, that, that on the one hand, it looks like this kind of normal building, but then you're kind of thinking, oh, is that flower that's just there? Or is that, or is that a, or what is that? You know, it, it, there's a kind of weird um, camouflage effect that it seems, at least it's insinuated in your renderings. And so I think I would love to just, you know, and this is where I think physical testing would be a great thing to do in another semester or in the summer or something. Um, see, how do you produce these effects? Because they're beautiful in the rendering and how do you actually make it happen? Mm -hmm. Would these things get, would, would this get really warm? Some of these? Well, just um, thinking um, there's, Oh, sorry. These are north facing, right? North is this the north facing, facing studio? Yeah, it's north yeah. facing facade. Uh, it's north facing, but but still in you know, I mean, in Austin, I think anything gets hot. It doesn't matter if it's north facing <laughs> uh, during the months of the summer. Yes, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, I was just thinking. Um, I think actually on on a window like this, bees probably would go and nest. Because if it's warm enough, but it doesn't have like you know direct sunlight, I think that's actually really good habitat condition. N Nerea remembers this in Buffalo. There was a window where all these bees just built a hive, and it was kind of basically a, sim a similar condition. Um, well, that was really a great discussion, and great to see um, all the work. Um, I think we're close to five. Um, if you have closing comments about uh, the, um, the project or, uh, uh, I mean, this particular project or, or the three that you have seen or Ryan, the, that's the whole class. Um, yeah, thank you so much for uh, joining us. Um, uh, Joyce, uh, Ryan and Clay, this was a great uh, so good. Uh, I wish, yeah, I wish the projects had more time to continue to develop. No, in that uh, you guys really made uh, wonderful suggestions. Um, so, yeah. Well, I would just say maybe a couple things. Uh, first, I guess congratulations to uh, all of you because, or almost all of you, I guess, as this is kind of your your uh, last studio session, right? At least. Maybe, maybe for a while or, uh, or maybe not, I don't know. But, um, but so congratulations in general, but also for just the work of the studio, because for me, it was really just inspiring to see this kind of work being done, because I think it's, um, it's so easy for us to focus in on like kind of normative approaches to solving problems or even just the issues we take on. So just the kind of format of the studio. And I think even though the studio were obviously was um, impacted by the, the larger situation in, rela in relationship to what you could do. You know, I think there still seemed like a really strong narrative in the studio about making things and really physically testing and then obviously thinking about a form of research and looking at, uh, you know, these uh, other kinds of beings and how they imagine or really engage the world and, and trying to deal with that. I mean, it's not an easy thing and, and, and certainly requires a lot of creativity, I think, as well, and imagination, which I think you all did a, an amazing job at. So I'm just really so excited to see the work. And, and, and the last project, this one in particular, given the duration, I mean, I think every project you could easily, as it was already kind of said, but if you just actually said, okay, we're gonna build this now and start to test out and prototype, I mean, that's a whole nother mm -hmm. phase that you, of course, all well know, given your earlier work in the semester. So I think, um, I think that's just really, really uh, ex exciting to see. And I would encourage you in whatever form, whether it's uh, just independently over the summer or maybe even in an office that you engage with, you know, moving forward to kind of pursue opportunities, oh, maybe along these lines, because of course in other environments, you don't necessarily get those automatically. So I think now that you've had a, a kind of interesting, unique experience related to who you're designing for and 
even seeing what design can do in a very different way, I think don't hold, don't let that go. I would try to hold on to that as you move forward in whatever way you do, uh, professionally or further kind of academic studies. So, yeah, congrats. Yeah, I just I want to congratulate everyone too. I think um, the projects. I'm I'm glad to have been able to see half of the studio. I kind of now wish I could see the entire studio, but I, I see, I have access to your box. I'll look through all your folders. Um, and uh, I, the projects just look incredible. And it's amazing that you've all been able to do so much work during this kind of disruptive time. Um, you know, and, and not only the work that we're seeing today, but just, I, I saw the videos that um, were produced for the Fusebach Festival and all the work that you'd been doing before. So it's incredible that you've been able to pull all this together. So really great job. I also think it's fascinating, um, you know, that I think you're, the class is a mix, right? Between sort of architecture and interiors or, um, and, and this, this is final year, right? Um, is this last year? And final year, um, final year, it, it, it happens, it, it could be a more of a mix, but this, this semester is really final year for, it's really final semester, final day for everybody but one student. Everybody's <laughs> graduating. Uh, some are, uh, so there's three, no, four uh, masters, no? Uh, and then uh, interior design masters, two architecture students, and the rest, uh, which is the majority, uh, interior design undergrads. Yeah. Uh -huh. Oh, that's fascinating. Well, I just think it's just, it's really incredible that, you know, you have such a mix of students um, and, you know, of course, design and um, interior design and architecture are, are related fields, but that you're all, you know, even interior design students taking on these kind of really interesting questions of ecology and not thinking about the interior only as a kind of in, like interior within the walls condition, but thinking about the exterior quite broadly as well. So I think that's really wonderful. Um, yeah, it's very, it's a real pleasure to, to see the work. So thank you. Yeah, congratulations. <laughs> Thanks, Joyce. Yeah, just, uh, yeah, congratulations to everybody out there. I got to see some of the, most of the projects in some form or fashion throughout the semester. So I'm really happy about that. Um, and the work that you kind of repurposed for um, Digital Fuse Box was, was really awesome. Um, I think the, the, the idea about making and prototyping and, and using all of these different tools and bringing them together and synthesizing um, the technical ideas with big, massive conceptual uh, ideas and the implications of all this is a is a, a really important. I think um, you know putting ourselves into contact with with creatures that aren't human and trying to understand where they're coming from, literally. I think is not just an academic exercise. I think it's actually a, a, a incredibly important thing that we should be invested and engaged in. If we're not, gonna, if we're going to at least try to fix the fuck up that we've created, and so like I think you know this is a, this is not just academic work. This is like ethical, big picture. Uh, how do we deal with this stuff and maybe get ourselves out of the center of the picture and look at the bees and look at the pollinators and look at the flowers and see ourselves as part of that instead of on top of it. And so like, I think this is one way to do that. Um, and I think it's timely and, and pertinent and urgent. And so um, I'm into beauty too. And I think beauty is a performance requirement for everything that y'all do. And so like, I think, uh, Congratulations, and I hope you figure out ways to sort of continue this uh, thinking and project uh, and help us uh, all in the future. Good job. And good job, uh, Professor Feliz, as usual. Fantastic. <laughs> Great. Then uh, maybe because the students, maybe I can stay one second with the students because it's the last class. And then uh, so to, to coordinate uh, before we switch off <laughs> and then I, I can only reach you via email. Uh, but uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, again, Joyce, Ryan and Clay, this was awesome conversation. Thank you so much. Um, we stay in touch. Yeah. Yes, yes, thank thank you. You. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for inviting us. Yeah. Good seeing you. Yeah, bye Joyce, good to meet Thank you, Claire. You. Bye.